You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. So if I was bullied in the day, in the dormitories where you slept, at the end of the bed, they had a bar that come off. I would set the bar off in the middle of the night, they screwed on now, but I'll set the bar off at the end of the bed and do the kid in halfway through the night. Now, in a matter of no time, I had to be sleeping in cells because I was untrustworthy to sleep in dormitories because I would attack whoever attacked me. The doorman went out, come back with a gun, hold because they knew that the Massey firm was all capable, pulled the gun on Massey's firm, right? Yet again, there was already, the doorman was had an onslaught, bottled to death, put a van through a couple of their clubs, shot a couple of doors off with a shotgun. One of the most exciting things I've ever did in my life. But I had the shotgun, mentally knew that I most probably sometime in my career, I most probably end up with a life sentence. So why not begin it young? I was ready to, I've surrendered to myself. Yeah, what was gonna become of me? They sexually abuse you. They burn your testicles off. They will cut your lips off to pull your teeth out. When we're on, and today's guests have got silvers Paul Dodd. Nice one, James. How are you, brother? Yeah, good, you know. Good to see you out. Nice to be out. Very known in Underworld, very popular name. Um, just out of prison, spent nearly 30 years of it inside. Very well connected. But you're, now you're here today to, to tell your tale, it's an amazing thing. I believe I'm connected to friends. I don't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're looking well. Thank you. So I always go back to the start of my guests, where you grew up and how it all began. Well, it all began in the 50s when my, my mother, who was a young Jewish girl, big breasts, standing at a bus stop. She met my father, who was a big Irish man, a super heavyweight. And then they clicked. I couldn't tell you what year it was, but I know it was in the 50s. Then the next thing that happened was, by the time my mother was 25, she had seven children. Six lads, one girl. The girl's the oldest. Then, between them both, things never clicked. I don't know why. But um, they split up. Four went with my mother. Three went with my father. I went with my father. Become um, christened a Catholic. Passed me Holy Communion in Odsall. Then um, the other four become Jewish, yeah? So we even know your mother's Jewish, makes you Jewish, I become a Catholic. Now, my father had to bring up me, Michael, and my sister, Lorraine, yeah? So when my dad, in them days, I don't think you could get social, nobody had any money, so my dad had to go to work, then come home from work, and he had to go working again as a personal bodyguard, Gambling it was illegal, so we he did that as a job. When he went out at night time, me and my brother, Michael, who's one year older than me, he was about eight, I was seven, and we started burglaring. We knew it was in our genetics. Don't ask me why, but we uh, we started burglaring places, shops. Nobody had any money. We were just to get what we ever wanted, toffees, sweets, cakes, whatever. We started burglaring shops. Then we started to go for the money. Then the next thing that happened was we kept on getting caught, hanging about Manchester at three o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, at seven years, eight years of age. The police would pull us in, bring us home. Even at that age, we was getting good hidings by them. When you got home, you got another good hiding. So that carried on. Then before the age of nine, because we was uncontrollable and my dad couldn't keep us in the house when he went back to work, I was put in care. Now, the care homes was 
how can you describe it, military one. Yeah, it's like yeah, somebody becoming a gladiator would have to be taught how to be a gladiator. So in them days, when I say military one, at eight years of age, I had a pair of boots, short pants, a jumper with number 80 on the back and using house units, one arm's distance, stand to attention, stand at ease. You would march through every corridor, stop, stand to attention again. You slept in dormitories. Then you was more or less got in, there's been two world wars. You're, they, I think they had an attitude to treat you to go over the trenches. You still had that mentality in the what in the sixties, late sixties, early seventies. Everything was yes sir, no sir, I will sir. That's what they, it was us barbaric. How was it being away from your dad? Did you struggle? Or was it just survival mode straight away? It was, how, how can you say it? It's, um, I hardly seen my dad, he had two jobs. It was my sister, believe it or not, who was 10 years of, uh, who was 10 years of age, who was like a mother figure to me. She, she was the one, and she still is. She still tells me off now. <laughs> yeah. She must be the only one then, Paula. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny because she was the one that had some baffles and everything, <laughs> the steel baths. But, yeah, yeah, accepted what was coming. You, you, it's, it's a part of, uh, obviously, by the time I got out, I was institutionalised, but that was the part, the path of life. It, where it, it doesn't, after a week or two weeks, it's painless. It's painless, You've, you have to accept, because you're only young, you, you accept what's coming on the corner. Do you become numb to that life from a very young age? Yeah, it is, um, in later on, a lot later on, I've been in a system where people, big powerful men have burst out in tears and the system will say to them, man up. And even at a young age of eight years of age, you have to man up. You have to be ready for what comes. You can't um, hide in the shadows. You've got to face what's going to come. And even if it's face four or whatever. When did you start getting the reputation of one punch? Like when did you start learning how oh, to fight? Oh no, what do you call it? That, when I got put away um, at eight years of age, you was, you was learning to punch back. You wasn't there to be punched. That's the first thing you accept. Don't forget this is a Catholic blue school and I was the only kid in this Catholic blue school, dark skinned, black hair, and I was ready, to, I knew I, was, I had to punch back. Because I was only small and stocky, and I was the youngest in the place, I had to not only punch up, I had to bring another man down. So if I was bullied in the day, in the dormitories where you slept, at the end of the bed, they had a bar that come off. I would set the bar off in the middle of the night, they're screwed on now but I'll set the bar off at the end of the bed and do the kid in halfway through the night. Now, in a matter of no time, I had to be sleeping in cells because I was untrustworthy to sleep in dormitories because I would attack whoever attacked me. Now, I couldn't... Now, this most probably give me a path in life to bring a man down to my size because I think in all my life, I've never punched down. I've always had to punch up. So this is just a learning curve, how, how to handle it, how to more or less drink your own blood, how no surrender. And where young kids now, I mean, young kids are big, powerful lads now, and it wasn't in them days. Now, all my time in the reform schools, um, I never seen one lad knock another lad out. It was all about punching with speed and lasting the distance to the other kid give in. There was never no knockouts. You're, if another man fell to the floor, you'd be forever kicking him. Forget them Queensberries, our generation, which was a new generation, before us, they would was drilled the same way to go over the trenches. 
our generation learnt something new, and that was the F word, F U. We want you to do this, F U. And that's what it was about. We wasn't there to be mugged off. And that's, that was the big difference in the generations before you. We were totally different. We, that would, if they asked us to go over the trenches, we would most probably say, F you, but I'll go after you. See the screws, see when they beat you up, did it make you anti-authority straight away? You hate the folly too well before that. Yeah. You hate, you, it's like your genetics. Yes, sir. No, sir. And what, believe it or not, what, how, how can I explain it? What you learn, anybody that's been through what I've been through and I'm gone through the system, they learn to turn the other cheek. And what I mean by that is where in the early days, as a, as a child, if you hit back, you're finished. You'll be screaming for your mother. The, the, screw, the, the, co the coppers, even when I used to run away from the reform schools, and even at the age of 12, we was um, pinching cars, getting away, sleeping in cars. Now, one day I was um, arrested at 12 years of age. And when I was arrested at 12 years of age, I had 300 pounds in my pocket, which is like three grand now, if not more. So the, the coppers wanted to, this is 12 years of age, the coppers wanted to know where I got the 300 pound from. So obviously I said, I stole it from my own house, hoping they'll give it back to my dad, yeah? So then they give me a little slap, then they give me another slap, then I slap back. I thought, F you, I'm going down with a fight. They slap back. 12 years of age, they said, come on, Paul, we're taking you back to your reform school, what I was already in. They cuffed me up behind my back. As I was leaving the cell, because I was fighting back every time they hit me, they threw me back in. Now, I think this changed my life. They threw me back in and pounded me and pounded me for about five minutes, left the cell, covered in my own blood, they cut me, even cut me under the eye. It was covered in it. They had to take me to hospital. Now, but I, when they left the cell, I got up, sat on the seat thinking, wow, wow, how fantastic is that? Two big coppers couldn't finish me off. So I'm thinking now, if they couldn't finish me off, how can anybody in these reform schools, I'm not on about screws, I'm on about the other lads how can anyone do that is because yeah. i knew i was capable of taking the punch from there onwards so that made you tougher and more confident that you could take anything i knew in i knew then if because 90 percent of my fights when somebody would put it on me mentally i used to think to myself i'm in trouble i'm in trouble here because I'm looking up. I don't want to call it, and I know they're looking down. So I know they're going to come in on me. So I would onslaught them straight away. I wouldn't allow them to take the second breath. I wouldn't allow them to take the second word. I'll be in on them straight away. And uh, what do you call it? So I knew I could take a punch. That, when people talk and later on in life, when I, um, I was one howling everybody, one punching everybody, to me, that was the bonus. My heart and what I was capable of was receiving more than anything else. When did you get out of Boston? No, I in the... Um, approved I, school? The, the approved schools, because of my aggressive behaviour and because of the system, them um, realising that on a daily basis, I was defending myself, attacking other kids, whatever, right? Going out. Even one time I ran away from um, the reform schools. I think this time was about 16, yeah? I, was, I ran away from the reform schools. We robbed a couple of warehouses, right? What did you get? Oh, fantastic story as it happens, <laughs> right? I robbed a warehouse in the middle of Salford. As I, most pathetic thing you've ever heard. 
as we robbed this warehouse with these, I was like, no, I was about 14. I was with these kids, I was 16, from my own neighborhood, yeah? As I come on home leave and that. Now, when I was with these kids, we robbed the warehouse, they was doing what kids do, smashing the warehouse up, right? I go in the office to see what was there. Massive old Victorian safe. So I'm looking in the drawers, I see a key about four inches long. And I, even at a dumb age, I'm thinking nobody can be that stupid to, for that key to fit the safe, yeah? So then put the key in the safe, it works. Open the safe, there's three and a half grand there. Shut the safe, yeah? Cause these kids would have took the money off me being a lot older and shared it out between a lot of them or whatever. So I put the key back. Then, we, it's next to the air well. As we was getting out, no, I put the, the money in my underpants so these kids can't find it. So as we was leaving the place, the police are there. They chased us down the liver bank in, they let the dogs on us, I buried the dog. I'm an animal lover, but I buried <laughs> the dog. Coppers done me in again. Took me to hospital, full of blood. I go to hospital at four years of age. They want to give me a needle at the bottom. Now I'm thinking that they would find the money as I dropped my underpants to give me a needle because they had a couple of stitches off the beat and what the police give me. Then I said, look, I've got a big birthmark on my bottom. Can I just take out the needle at the top of the bottom? So when they did that, I go back to the police station because then now we want to be quizzed. They found out these three and a half that I'm missing. These kids, because it was a lot like it is now, you, you would never get a solicitor. Nobody knew nothing to say. That was unheard of. And everybody received good hidings. Everybody. So these kids were screaming. They've had no money. They've not seen any money. But so they was right. They haven't had any money. And they haven't seen any money. Now, they, because I was covered in blood, it looked like I've already took my kick in. They said, where's the money, Paul? I said, I don't know what you're on about. That you're asking the wrong person, right? So my father come, because I'm going to go back to the reform schools. My father come, and he said, say goodbye to me as I'm going, going to go away again. And I said to him, Dad, I've got this, because it's a waste of time me taking it back. Give him the three and a half grand. He said, Paul, God, for your own sake, don't say anything. You'll get yourself in more trouble. I'm going to hide this now. And I, I was buzzing for him. Hmm. No doubt he bought new carpets, the television, <laughs> whatever. How was it like when you're leaving your dad and stuff? Is that hard for you? Or are you just so in the system then and so numb towards life that it's just a normal experience for you? No, because if you've got... How can, how can you explain it? If you've got a picture of something, like I suppose it's part of religion. People look at Jesus Christ and there's people there that have never met the person, will worship him. And it's like somebody saying to me, that's your father. So inside my head, that's somebody special to me. Even though the 10 years I was away, I never had any visits, that was somebody special to me. Now in them days, the Victorian days, you was allowed one visit out every month. So that's when we used to go out. Then towards the end, of well, the same 17, 18, you was uh, wearing long pants again. It was a totally different setup. But there was still a lot of fighting between the lads. How was the communication with your friends and that in there? Did you build a strong relationship with people or was everybody just out for themselves? Well, everyone's... How can, how can you explain it? Now, the reform schools, what I went to, were... in. A special unit, I got sent to a special unit. And this is why I know that criminality is more or less genetics. Because when I got sent to this special unit, they said to me, your brothers are in here. Now, I said, who's my brothers? He said, Bradley and Wayne in this special unit for kids that are extra trouble, yeah? I went to this special unit and 
this was the first time I met my brothers. Now, when they was getting a visit off my mother, yeah, they said to my mother, you've got another son in here, Paul, he never gets any visits. Will you um, give him a visit? Now, that was the first time I seen my mother. Because I, when I left my mother, I was just over two years of age. So that was the first time I seen my mother. So then, after that, I got to, what do you call it, got to know the two brothers for about four weeks. Then, because I had a fight with this female murderer, right, again, 50-50 this time, it was punch for punch, they, did, they couldn't send her anywhere because of what she did. This was the only special unit would have her. So I got sent at, to um, Risley Prison at a very young age. Now, I was only in there, and then you got sent to Kirk Levington, which was a detention centre, because they wouldn't allow me to go out. Now, a detention centre, you train and train and train three times a day. Now, that got me into training, burpees, press-ups. That, I loved, believe it or not, Kurt Levington. Now, I was in there for a while. Then I got in, normally, you would spend three months in Kurt Levington, then go home. But they wouldn't with me. They sent me back to the, another reform school, St. Thomas More's. Now, I asked, could I go to a reform school is what my brothers was in. They brothers left the special unit, ended up at reform schools themselves, and they said no, that them reform schools won't be able to control you. So they knew the system knew I had some sort of problem, some aggressive Behaviour. mannerism. How yeah. was it seeing your mum for the first time? I was I mean it was like meeting a probation officer. It meant nothing to me. The picture I had on the wall was my father. What about your brothers? Were you happy that you'd seen your brothers? Oh, when, um, don't forget, I was never took to court. I was uh, the first charge. I was put away at eight, too young to go to court. You couldn't be in court for 10 years to uh, till you was age of 10. I ran away, I think I was about 10 and a half, 11 and a half. I ran away from the reform schools Slept in toilets around Manchester at five o'clock in the morning. This is how barbaric it is. Five o'clock in the morning, I'll come out the toilets, what was sleeping, what was locked at night, come out the toilets, got a first step, got a milk bowl from a shop, started drinking. That was my first charge. They, the coppers seen me drinking the milk bowl, drinking the milk, shivering, and that was my first charge. That's mad. Like, it's sad as well, like a 10 year old Bar kid, Barrett. like homeless in this city, like Bar just Barrett. try to live. Like, that wouldn't happen now. But back then, was it a shop, sharp treatment or something you used to get? It was like, it was like robotic. The kids used to get up at a certain time, they used to all dress the same, but the screws used to kick fuck out them. Yeah, and the police. Yeah. And not only the police, they, they, they'll handcuff you behind your back, they'll, they'll treat you like everybody gets it. Everybody gets it. Hmm. Now, what, what, the, um, what do you call it? These, um, obviously, your, your genetics, yeah? Your genetics, paddy genetics. I don't know if you, they, they come, we come from Vikings, Mary Queen of Scots, got um, 20,000 Spaniards over to fight the English. So it's all fighting material are that of genetics in Ireland. So the, we, the Irish are fighting genetics and that's where part of my genetics have come from. So when the system brings you up to be a gladiator, fighting every day, willing to go on the battlefield, so at the end of it, when you're coming out of the reform schools, all they're doing is cutting a chain. And when you're, you're out in the outside world, apart from the one day's own leave, it's a new world to me. I've never paddled in the sea. I've never really gone and enjoyed summer. Did you see when you got your home leaves as a kid, where did you go? Yeah, you, you, you went to the blocks of flats in uh, Manchester. Man, so for that, the early on when I got put away, was um, all two up and two down houses. Yeah, front room, kitchen, 
two bedrooms, yeah? Then when I got, when I was coming on home with, over the years, they all got pulled down and there was all blocks of flats. So you went on home leave, you got into Manchester by train at 10 o'clock and you had to be back at the station at five o'clock. So when you're talking once a month, you're talking about six hours out. So all you, all you did is spend it in your block of flats. Mm -hmm. So see, when you've done your 10 years in approved school, what did you do when you came out? Well, that's a good question because that was the start. Yeah, of the journey. Yeah, that was the start of your journey. But it's now, to give people an understanding of how you end up involved in the lifeline. This is why these interviews are so powerful is because people need to get an understanding of why men become the men that they are from the rough environment, from the broken home and fighting your whole life to then survive and being on the streets homeless at 10. Like, did it f also fill you with rage as well, Paul? That like, You thought, fuck it. Like, did you ever feel not loved as well, where that becomes an effect in your life from a young age? No, because you don't cry over that because you don't know nothing. Mm -hmm. if, if somebody had that and lost that, then you would cry for that. But if somebody hasn't had that, there's no tears. You've accepted, you realise that you would look at a person without verbally exchanging, and I would know straight away what his attitude is with his eyes. So I would go on with the onslaught. Mm -hmm. It sounds stupid, but that's how you are. You become, you become aware in your own head. You're, you're telling your own self a story, what is about to happen. When I come out of the reform schools, I didn't know anybody. I've been away all my life. I didn't have friends. Now, it was the same as my brothers. They've been away all their lives. One of them is the shyest kid on the planet. He still is. He never, he'd come out of the reform school, Wayne, and he wouldn't talk to any. He never talked to anyone until he was about 27. Why is that? Because of the way the system brought you, he was in with him himself. The system more or less taught him to say nothing apart from yes, sir, no, sir. I will go over the trenches, sir. And that's how it brought you up. Mm -hmm. But there was an army of them. Now, I remember seeing a documentary about, um, what's, what's he called? The big fighting lad in London, Lenny McLean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the kid he had a fight with. They, those two, was like the, the most aggressive in London. They was brought up in the reform schools. And that's why they banned the reform schools. Yeah, so it, it was brought up with the same mentality. Conditioning tough men. Because... Yeah, and it was, the reform schools, the only way to describe them is in the film Scum. Remember the film Scum? Yeah. Where they wear big embrace and they wear boots yeah. and it's kicking off all the time. And you're getting done in. That's exactly where. That's exactly what it was like. But it was getting you ready for a world of violence. And it was say if I'm going out, I'm burdening places. I'm at the age of fourteen. I've got three and a half hundred pound in my pocket, where the normal kid would never see that. And say I, what do you call it? I've had thousands. I'm not coming out to be a window cleaner. I'm not coming out to be a brick rail. I'm coming out to be a villain. I'm, I, I couldn't read and write. I didn't know what vowels was. I couldn't spell, I was dyslexic. So nobody's gonna give me a job. And um, so I'm coming out. So I come out, not on my brother's doors. The local pub, what I started to drink in, I was still living with my father at the block of flats. And um, I got a lease under the, from the age of eight I come out just before my 18th birthday. Like I said, I knocked on my mother's door. We started to drink in the local. Now, in this local, um, I was ready for the outside world, started to fight, one or two fights. Then, that was the first knockout I did, yeah? Then the next thing is, I was beginning to get a reputation. People realised he was coming down. Every time somebody seen me, they couldn't believe. I was the kid with this reputation at 11 and a half stone. Not because in my head, I knew that I was capable because of the beating from the coppers, that I was capable 
of taking punches. I knew the other person, whoever punched me, was also hurting his knuckles on my head. Didn't bother me, right? Didn't, I wasn't even bothered to put my chin down. I knew they was in trouble. As soon as it started, but I was knocking everybody out. But to, to the big six footers, now six foot was a massive height in them days, yeah? But I was, because I was stocky, I was always like 14 stone. If I wanted to pull a bird in them days, all I had to do was wear a T-shirt. And it's unbelievable, because I had, I had a good physique, not blowing my own trumpet, 30-inch waist, and I was 14 stone. And that was before steads come out. I've never took a stead in the life, I never had to. But people were just 11 stoners, 12 stoners. So I was fighting with weight as well. So then I started to get a reputation, but the, in the local where I was at, there was another aggressive who went through the system like I have, another aggressive young firm, which was led by Paul Massey. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, big got, name out there in the papers yeah, and stuff. Beautiful kid, who was led by Paul Massey. Now, Paul Massey had a gang that worshipped him. Robin Mason, the McDonald brother, very well-known kids around Salford, yeah? Now, they was at criminality at its best. That they, before, they, before they was 20, they, would, they was out burdering, or that then he went to the next stepping stone. And the next stepping stone was where in them days, if somebody was to get wages, they would go to the bank to pick up the wages, or if a shopkeeper was to collect money all day, they would go to the bank to put the money in the night safes, yeah? We would be there waiting for them things to happen, and we would be robbing them. And that's where I got involved with them, because I was more or less because of my reputation. As they was to grab the money and we had any superheroes coming, I was ready to what do you call it, to stop them coming along. And, yeah. yeah. See, because everything that you threw at a young age, you become fearless at a certain age in your life Well, you can handle getting punched, you can handle in a fight, you can handle doing robberies. Like, do you just be, does it just become so easy because all the shit that you'd went through from a, as a kid? Yeah, but you, you, it's not only that. I mean, you come fearless. Then you think to yourself, right, this is what I am. This what could lie ahead. Now, what could lie ahead in them days, for, there was no shootings. Forget about people being shot. That, that never happened for a couple of years afterwards. In fact, we was one of the, I was one of the first to get shot at, but it was um, with a shotgun. I had pellets at the bottom of my legs. But in those years, all you would get is a good hiding from other firms. That's all you would get you would get good hiding from the police, yeah? You would uh, most probably have, you, you realise you might have, because of the snatches, spend so many years in the prison. So you accept what could be coming. And as soon as you've surrendered to what could be coming, the more fierce you are, mm. the more uncaring you are. See, when you started getting a reputation of being a man who could fight, see when people seen you, do you then become a target? and be tested more because you were smaller than the man who was six feet, six feet one. In them days, yeah. because I had a reputation and because I was young, and now when I had a reputation, I had a following. Most of my life, I've had a following, right? So these kids who, how can I say, these kids who are capable and I know the way the mannerism are, I'll be ready to attack them first. They're, I'm not going to wait for them to attack me. I'll most probably have heard of them anyway. So I would be attacking them first. So my reputation grows. So when they, 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 on the odd time, people would want a, a straightener or one-to-one -one on the odd time. But normally when I used to go in a place, and there used to be four or five lads um, already, already known. We wouldn't, we could be in the place two minutes, three minutes. Why wait for them? 
we all do the onslaught first. And I realised, and that's been the path of my life years on. Could you read situations well, Paul, because of being on your own for so many years? Say that again. Could you read situations well and read people well? It's part of survival. Yeah. You, you, be, you become... Um, you become aware, you're like, you've got hyenas around you. Now, say the likes of me, more so Paul Massey, you likes of me, Paul Massey, people with big names, they become what I would call a front runner, yeah? And now what I mean by a front runner, there could be 10, being a football hooligan, hundreds of times I've run in, so it sounds stupid, to 100 lads, 50 lads, because I know I'm a front runner, that's expected of me. So if there's a firm that there, and it could be 20, 30, whatever, I will steam in knowing the hyenas that are at the back of me will be steaming in afterwards. So that's what you do, you go in as a group. So you're well aware of the situation. Now this was right before, before weapons come out, but you'll be onslaughtering them. Now, there was a, there was a um, like, where we, we stepped the road of criminality, we started to do robberies. The, um, we took over, our reputation grew. We, because of my violent attitude, all them wanted to earn money. I had the pleasure of having a fight. I, that's what I've, I was cloned to do. I knew I could fight. I But at the beginning, everybody was like that to me as I'm getting older and having all these kids with reputations fight. Everybody, God, Doyle, you heard you, you've just done. He's this, he's that, you've done him in seconds. Now my reputation grew, grew and grew. So I would go into, what do you call it, go into clubs, the doorman then would want to have it. I would knock the doorman out. My friends then would do all the rest of it. We would steam clubs around town. Manchester then was run, run by a firm called the Quality Street. They had um, they started a union off where all the doormen got together. And if one doorman had a problem, they all had a problem. Yeah. So then we um, we had they wanted to come down to show us what they're capable of. They come to Manchester lads coming to Salford is stupid. If you start, if you're in a pub in Salford in them days and you're from another area, you stood out, don't matter how big you are, whatever, and you come in and you had a bit of a problem, everybody in that pub would attack you. Makes no odds. Even the women, the old women, the old men would be hitting you with bottles. It was a, just a no-go area for other people, Salford in them days. Now, we was in there when Prince Charles was getting married the day of Prince Charles getting married. Five or six big heavyweights, part of a firm that was connected, that wanted to teach us, because there had been a many around Manchester, come down, they come in, pulled, say there were six of them, five stood at the bar, one come over to where we was, me, Massey, Matt Gar, Navi, the, whoever, Rob Mesa, they come over to us and said, look, we, one guy come over, he said, I'm sick and tired of you. So what are you call it? What are you doing? You're messing about. Thing. So a kid um, called Matt Carr told him to F off. The F word, fuck you. It happens. This, this is what our generation is. It don't matter what these other firms are capable of, F you. Don't matter what the police are capable of, F you, the system. Then this guy, potted my car. We then, me and my other friend, attacked the five doormen at the, the five big guys at the bar. The guy who did the potting ran off. Massey and his firm chased after him, picked him up, uh, beat him up, picked him up, threw him at a bus, yeah? More or less, the police come, they done the policing. Now I'm in the pub battling, I've been seen. They get charged with a section 18 and attempted murder. Massey get, they all get a guilty. Now the day of the court, in the day of the trial, they're all going not guilty, obviously. Right, the day of the trial, the, the wife brings the husband in, 
in a wheelchair and says, I have to dress this, my husband, every day because of these bastards, blah, blah, blah. They get a guilty. You get five years because they're only young kids. Five years in them days was harsh. How old were you? I, I was 21, down about. And Massey, and Navi and Matt Carr, and Scott, they was um, round about 18, 19, yeah? Now, I was the one with the reputation as a fighter. They're criminals. Massey was one of the most criminal-minded kids you would want to meet. He's not fighting stature, but he's game. He was a tap five or six screws by himself. He's like a Jimmy Boyle, exactly the same. He's fearless. Now, when, but he had his firm around him. He had a firm of hyenas that was the worst on the planet. Now, when they got the five years and the wife said, I have to dress my husband, yeah, Massey, who uh, got the five years, while he was doing the five years, yeah, he appealed. Then, this guy who was in the wheelchair, four months after, he made a film, because he's a martial art expert, doing Kung Fu in the film. <laughs> Mashi, exactly. Mashi gets the tape, takes the tape to court, and said, this is the man that has to be dressed every morning, jumping in the air four foot, kicking somebody in the head. How can that be? So Mashi won his appeal. Then when Mashi come out, they all clicked together again. Then Massey had a new what used to happen. Now, I've always been involved with United, Manchester United. Uh, going away, fighting, more or less fighting with other fans was the buzz. Now, if I was to explain in the 70s, what used to happen is you used to be able to pay to get in grounds, football grounds. So when United, being the biggest supporting club, in the world, don't know about Glasgow or Rangers, but being the biggest supporting club, they used to take 20,000 plus to every away game, right? Now, 90% of the people, 99% of the people, you talk about being a hooligan, they just think getting another fan, pulling his hair down and volleying him in the head, yeah, to be screaming for his mother, whatever. No, but it wasn't about that. If people like me used to see it as a graft, where you would, they had football specials. There used to be 1,500 on a football special, right? You'd, all that week, it would be in the papers around them surrounding areas, United's Barmy Army are coming to town, they're gonna wreck the place, whatever. We used to go there during the week, suss out where the jewelry shops are, where it's worth jumping over the counter, looking for places with money. So when the football special pulls up, you have 6,000 hooligans from the surrounding areas waiting for United fans. Then you, these United fans will think 1,500 is not good enough. They'll wait for three more specials to come. Even the Cottonies used to bring so many football specials. They could bring five specials. Then when they're out attacking the other 6,000, attacking six or 7,000, we will be over the counters and you'll be doing jewelry shops. When we started to go abroad, we will, we'd done a jewelry shop in Amsterdam worth for two million quid. It was big news then because that would have been about 20 million. I mean, but that would have been about between 200 people. The whole, everyone was there just to do the jewelry shops. That's what you weren't looking for. Now, the Scousers, because they, they, they um, was always in Europe, in the European Cup, they used to go over with visa cards. And it's what you call, it's what you call kiting. Now, if I mean, you get a bent visa card and you go in a shop, buy something with it, yeah? Now, in them days, if your signature matches on the visa card, they normally let you have whatever, right? Now, so you put in breakthrough it, it takes off the other person's signature. You could put your own signature on the, the, the visa card and buy in this country, they would only allow you to spend, to buy something for 20 pounds. In Europe, if you've got a passport with the same name, obviously, 
they would allow you to spend £400, £600 because you've got proof of identity. Now, you could get year passports in them days. So we used to send people in, get the passport, take a little picture off yourself, put it on that. So we massively come out. So we started to hit Europe doing, um, doing the kiting. Now, we was at first, Massey went over with three or four lads. On one occasion, 20 Salford lads went over there to, to Europe. First of all, we hit Brussels. Within two hours, we've kited up half of Brussels. Then you was also go over to do sneaks. Now, Brussels and Holland, all over Europe, was very trustworthy. Now, they, you would go in the shops, the jewelry shops, all they had was curtains. So you would have some, one of your lads chat to the owner and you would be able to like try and snipe the gold watches. Over here, the gold in them days was all nine carat over in England. The Rolexes was the silver Rolexes with a little gold in the middle. But over there, you had 18 carat gold, which was unheard of in England. So. I, as I was in Brussels and they're doing the counting, I tried to steal and clumsy the 18 carat gold. The owner come over, whack, knocked him out. We realised the shop is ours. So we, we emptied it, 200 grand's worth of gold. Then we decided, because we wasn't part of the EU then, if you went from one country to the next, the, the police then couldn't go into that country. So we went into Holland. We go into Holland, we've all got the suitcases come out, you know, the small suitcases with wheels, they come out. We all had got the best of clothing, even the fashion, a cost T-shirts, you couldn't get in England, but Europe was two years in advance than us in clothing, fashion. So then we used to just go over there for the fashion. Now we've got 200 grand worth of gold. We've got thousands of pounds worth of clothing, the best of fashion. We then we hit, started to hit the bars. And when we was in the bars, what happened was everyone, the girls over there, buy, you, you could buy them little bottles of champagne. That was their black. So they must have got wages if you were buying them bottles of champagne. So one of the kids said, there's my card, American Express just come out. There's my card, American Express. I'll pay for everyone's. As they're there enjoying themselves, I look behind the bar, there's a cash pot. So no matter how much I've earned in the day, I'm a grafter. If I see a cash pot, I'm going to try and graft it. Me and my friend, yeah, did the cash pot, tried to, got it, got off. The doorman went out, come back with a gun, hold it, because they knew that the Massey's firm was all capable, pulled the gun on Massey's firm, right, Yet again, there was already, the doorman was at an onslaught, bottled to death, had the gun took off him, legged off. That was the first time anybody had one of them, yeah, legged off. Then we went into Germany from Holland, because we knew the Dutch are now on our cases in Belgium, France and Holland. We go into Germany. I decided, I should have decided to send my stuff home by post. So instead of taking it through the customs, yeah, I sent everything home by post, right, to my mother's house, whatever, my girlfriend's house. They um, all decided to kamikaze it through it. Now, there's a kid called, um, say, um, Adfield, yeah? A kid called Athfield on the on the train to where we're we're going to the boat, or even on the boat before we hit customs, he went to the toilet. Everything was thrown in his suitcase. Yeah. He also, even the gun we took off the doorman was in his suitcase. And he, when he was walking through the customs, he's like, ah, is anyone gonna search me as loud as he can? But they just let him go. The news that idiot just let him go. <laughs> on, the, yeah, on the train back to London, everyone's demanding. He nearly fainted when he was all mm. demanding the stuff back. You but can that's tell, how it yeah. was. You can tell you're a proper grafter, though, Paul, because every time you've got gear or money in your trousers or 
you're always trying to think of a way how to get it home or keep it. But yeah, that's what they call it. In years to come when people were doing drugs, they started to send drugs home by. But we, I was one of the first to realise that was the method mm -hmm. to, to send it back. But they put, the, the English police knew what we did. The English police knew that um, what we doing shootings, they knew the strength of what we was about. They, could, they, had, they put the biggest operation on us, England's known. Do you think you were making too, too much noise, too young? Yeah, it's more or less down to what do you call it, more the, the hated Massa. Now, the, the Massa got what, more than anybody else because he was like uh, an organiser, very, very, very criminal minded. More or less because of what he did when he uh, when they, they threw the guy out of bus and they beat the police up. They knew what this firm was about. The McDonald brothers, yeah, they used to do uh, they used to do robberies. The first ones to pull them out on robberies. There was the gamers to come when they was even one or two times when they was put on remand in strange ways. In them days, the world was only half mass. And nowadays, if you see a slain way wall, prison wall, they have a bubble over it. In them days, it was half mass. We used to put ladders, because we never lived too far away from slain ways, at the back of slain ways, where there's a small wall, up against the wall, rope at the top of the ladder, so we could go over, break in slain ways, run over to the windows, pass the weed over, people started smoking weed then, pass the weed over, and then go back to the go back to the rope, over. Now, on one occasion, Massey decided to escape. He was on remand, yeah, because doing petrol. He decided to escape. The kids went over, passed him a saw. He um, sold the bars, yeah, got off. Him and the kid called Navi, run to the rope, they come on top with the screws, they let the dogs out, and then he decided to go on the roof and protest about spending too long on the remand. Now, that's what, Massey, that's what Massey was about. They half killed him, what do you call it, when he come down. And he even again, he even had somebody to go over the wall. And he even tried to escape on Christmas Eve, very unlucky mm. again. What was it like being a football hooligan? Did you enjoy that period? Yeah, not only did it... Of course, I mean, I had um, two sets of friends to the hooligans. Now, these, the, the lads are hooligans where you can, why they're hooligans, you could just have normal nine to five lads, right? They will have a nine to five job. They dress the part, they look the part. If you was to turn around and say that that person is a gangster and that person is a hooligan, 90% will say the, the way the gangsters are dressed, that they're hooligans. And the way the hooligans are dressed will say they're gangsters because they're all designed up. They're all, they're all like professionals at violence where they're even one time, where I think we was playing um, Everton once and we're walking down the road. This is in a book. Uh, one of the Everton hooligans wrote a book and he said we was uh, playing Manchester. And this is his words. He said we was playing Manchester United he said, normally when people come to Liverpool, he said, when we run at them, they run off. He said, now on this occasion, these 50 of us, this is his words, he said, we was running at this firm of United fans. And he said, and, um, they wasn't budging. He said, we was getting closer. He said, he said, he was thinking in his head, what's this about? How come they're not getting off? He said, then he come up close to us. He said, he steamed us. He said, the next thing, he's knocked out. Right, he said. Then he find out one of the United fans told him after the game, "Don't worry, the kid who knocked you out knocks everybody out." Mm -hmm. And that's where we become very professional, more professional, in uh, in violence with them. They would do the who they would do the gangsters, but they wouldn't go to the next level. Mm -hmm. They would do them on a night out, but the gangsters would go through the front doors. Who was the toughest firm you came up against? Oh God, you couldn't. Pack like, one. No, there was a, there was a, You could go back to the earlier days, where 
you could go against Newcastle and say that the fencing's there, the gates will separate by fencing. One Geordie, would you, I don't know, it's a sign of bravery, I don't know, one Geordie will get on the fence and jump over into all the United fans, knowing he's going to take a kick in. There was fearless, there was fearless, but then you would have Leeds fans. Now, a Leeds fan had been arrested and more or less done in a couple of times in Leeds. Leeds fans, if they got a charge sheet and it was against Manchester United, they would pin it on the wall proudly that I've been charged fighting Manchester United fans because they, was most, because they hated us more than anyone. Why is that hatred so strong between Leeds and Man U? Well, because of the numbers, I suppose, because of the numbers. United hate Liverpool more than anyone. Yeah. Now, I used to think it's uh, down, to, down to the violence. Now, when I say United hate Liverpool, I mean, well, I'm not just talking about on the football field. You couldn't, Man Liverpool wouldn't um, come into Manchester in the early 70s, in the 70s or early 80s, because they'll be done in. It'll be vice versa. Man couldn't go into Liverpool. They wouldn't mix the um, Scousers and Manx in, in prison. Uh, one time I was in a prison called Lindo. Not one Scouser was in there, and there was a riot. But the people was running about looking for Scousers. Not only was he running about on the riot looking for nonces, they was running about looking for Scousers. And that was the hatred. And what it all becomes about, and I don't know if people don't know this, it come from 200 years ago or 150 years ago when uh, Manchester was blackmailed by Liverpool because we had to buy the cotton off him. So Manchester got 20,000 navvies to build the Manchester Ship Canal. They built the Manchester Ship Canal. At the end of the Ship Canal is Salford. Now that's where my ancestors come from because they turned the 20,000 navvies turned Salford in the biggest shit all on the planet. Now that's why Salford has got a lot of um, his roughness and ready. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of Irish community. What, was the, what age did you first go to the adult prison? I was in the adult prison when I was 12. I got put in the adult prison. What? Yeah, I was in, because when they, when they had the fight in the reform school with the girl, they didn't know what to do with me. They can't just uh, send me to, uh, to another reform school and give their, send their problem on, because I was in a special unit. So they couldn't keep me in this special unit, so there was no other special unit in the north. So they didn't know what to do with me. So they sent me to, uh, what do you call it, Rizla. Now, I was only small, yeah, so I was in Rizla. Now, when I'm, I've never forgot it. Now, the, when you land in prison, the second day in there, your night after being in the cells, you go and see the doctor. Because I was like that, and everybody was big cons, you, I've seen the doctor, you're in a room with all the adults, yeah? So I was in there, and everyone, all the, all the big cons was laughing to see me at such a young age. So one of them went like that. He said, come over here, sit on my, sit on my knee and earn yourself a Mars bar. Now everyone started laughing for you because it, was, it wasn't like it is now. I was thinking, where is that joke? Earn yourself a Mars bar. And for years, I couldn't figure out. I know he was messing about what the joke was Fox. for years. When did you get your first sentence as an adult? What age? I got my first sentence as an adult um, when we we did Europe. Did you get caught? No, they did us for um, doing the national clearing banks. Yeah. And when we did them, because we was going over with visa cars, yeah, mm. I got four years. At first, I got eight years, which was ash. But then the next day, they brought us back to court and dropped it to four best feeling I've ever had in my life. But uh, Massey got six years, I got four years. The other thing they were saying, something like 32, where it was in all the papers, England's biggest operation on us. And the, when I went into court, they, they even said the prosecution, this man's the tip of the iceberg. It was the first time we went over there. <laughs> was, uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't think it. Where did like, you do your four? I, I, when, when, uh, now, 
when I was having problems with the uh, the quality screen, yeah. Was that Jimmy? Jimmy. Yeah, Jimmy was the boss. Yeah. It wasn't. He wasn't the one I was having problems with. They're on a step above in Vinnie Scarborough on another level. Yeah, they were all proper yeah. back in the day. Yeah. They wanted bowing in front of, right? But all their firms lower, yeah, where they all started to do a union, they was all connected, yeah? Now, there was a couple of clubs around town because when Massey got put away for, yet again, when uh, Prince Charles was getting married, he, when he was doing his five years, everyone started to come for me, right? So I knew he had a problem. I was walking towards the pub with my girlfriend. Out at the, um, outside the pub, there was a Rolls Royce, soft, soft top Rolls Royce, big guys all surrounding it, started all pointing at, at me. She turned around, the missus turned around and said, run, I was already gone. And that's when I heard the blast where I felt the pellets at the bottom of my legs. I was the first person to be shot. Now, then every club after that, every club I went in, like the doorman used to say to me, Paul, please do yourself a favor, get out as fast as you can. I was only young in my early twenties. Now, when I used to get out for the fire, I see, I see cars spin up. So then the guy who more or less was running this firm or was after us, the, he, I went out to uh, one of the doormen, can't you like sort it out with him? He said, go down, he was doing uh, protection work at an arcade. He said, go down to the arcade on the Sunday and um, you'll have a chat and we'll finish the, the problem off. So I'm thinking, I'll go to the arcade, get myself a good hiding, yeah? Then I'll be able to go to clubs without cars pulling up and that'll be the end of it. So I went to the arcade, said to this guy, right, where are we having it? Yeah. He stood up, but I'm not waiting. Somebody stands up, right, so they give him, give him the onslaught, knocked him out, <laughs> asking anyone else. So that more or less thing. So then I knew we had a problem. Put a van through a couple of their clubs, shot a couple of doors off with a shotgun. One of the most exciting things I've ever did in my life. When Even when Massey come out, we still had a bit of a problem with him. Now, we took over this um, this yard, what was connected to them, yeah? I then knew, got myself another shotgun. You couldn't get handguns in them days. Then to get a shotgun, you, was, you had to see loads of people, knew nothing possible to get hold of. But I had a shotgun, mentally knew that I most probably sometime in my career, I most probably end up with a life sentence. So why not begin it young? I was ready to, I've surrendered to myself, yeah, what was gonna become of me. Mm -hmm. So nothing, I was fearless. N nobody knew what a ballet was. Nobody knew what glo um, gloves was, right? There was no, nothing to say, in, nobody knew nothing to say in the police station. No solicitors. What did the police used to do, just give you a good hiding and verbally say you confess to whatever when you've not even seen the interview room. Mm -hmm. That's how corrupt the place was. So anyway, I was there ready to, to shine, yeah? Ready to have my days come, waiting for this thing to whack whoever one out. But Massey went to see the main kids. The main kids, soon, he said, look, this lunatic's ready. Let's sort it out. Then it half sorted out. So I had a meeting then with Jimmy Swords, yeah? When I had a meeting with Jimmy Swords, he said, look, we know you're a loose cannon, blah, blah, blah. We're going to give you the VIP treatment at certain clubs, but do us a favour, stay out of these other clubs with your entourage, right, because we had a following, and yeah, we'll, we'll blossom. So when I first landed in, the, in prison, Jimmy Swords got me a job on reception. Mm -hmm. So he looked after me, so Jimmy. was it sorted then? Was that it smoothed over? Yeah. So what did you do when you came out? Well, when I come out, I was um, I was 30 years of age. When I um, when I was in, in the system, because I've always been into my fitness, yeah? Because cause I was naturally stocky and say, big arms or whatever. I didn't have to do weights. 
I've never, I've never lifted more than forty k in my life. You wouldn't think. You'd think different, though. Yeah, because my dad was a big Irish guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean big. Yeah, sixty-two inch chest. The old-fashioned um, armchair, your mother, grandmother's armchair, was a perfect fit for his coat. He could put massive that broad. So anyway, so I've had a natural feet. So all I had to do was keep my fitness up to get a good physique. So all it says, so every prison I've more or less been in, even at old age, I've always had a gym or this job. Thousands of burpees, thousands of sit-ups, press-ups, unbelievable. Now, I even think I can break the world record on certain things, sit-ups and that. So when I was in Lindholm, I had a gym or this job. When I, put, I had to do the uh, put lines on the outside field, which was locked, right, the outside football field, which was locked. Now, I had my missus come up, throw tennis balls over with weed in them. Yeah, again, one of the first to throw over the fence. Then when they opened up the fields to be to walk back into the prison, I had, I was giving somebody to sell out. I was on like a thousand pound a week, if not 1500, which is like six or seven grand now. So I come out to big money. When I come out, Massey also come out. Now Massey spent most of his twenties in the in the system. So mentally, Massey, they say the system keeps you young. Yeah? Massey come out with a mentality of a 20-year-old. He started to hang about with a young firm for Modso. Salford have many areas. And one area doesn't click with the other area. It's, it's pathetic, but that's what happens. Weed has just come out, cannabis. People were starting to sell it all around Salford. He used massive bring firms into our area. He's got himself a new young click. People in my area are crying to me about this firm for Modso coming in. We get, say, right, we'll meet him on the Sunday night in the pub. They come down. We, we had 120 lads there waiting, 120 Budweiser's getting thrown at the door. One of the most aggressive battles you've seen. Half of them got off. Two lads got shot the day after. But that's when our fallout begun with me and this other firm. I wouldn't say Paul Massey because I would, would never throw punches at Massey. Not out of fear, because I, I feared no one. But I would, because out of friendship, and we had that sort of click throughout our lives. But his firm despised me. They were a lot younger, they despised me. But still, that um, at any age, I wasn't ready to bow. In them days, you put somebody that's reaching 30 years of age, when I got put away at, um, just before I was 27, and I, I knew I was coming out when I was 30, I was thinking to myself, God, my life's over. But you don't realise how young 30 is. Yeah. So that, that's madness mm -hmm. about it. How was that when it started to tear apart with you and Marcy? Like, were you just thinking, fuck it, just go on with it? Or, you, or was it upsetting you, the way things were going? No, because I was too professional. I was, we was both professionals of violence. We, you, you meet um, even these young kids now that are, that are going about now. We open the door for society now. The, our society now know how to play the game. In fact, a hundred times better than us. A hundred times better than us. But we was the first, and we knew what we was both capable of. Yeah, I. I had no fear factor about anybody. I've accepted that I could go on the battlefield, get took out. It's what you accept. You, everybody used to, as a young kid, I used to always dream about going the same way as John Wayne did. That's what you accept. You accept the battlefield. You accept the, the being locked up in a cell, the, the being able to do your burpees, being able to do your step ups. You sit up, you accept that, you get, you get through it. So you have no fear factor about violence. Now, when these, these young kids who are just learning that, they, you can't put a whole dead on young shoulders. Now, like I said, I'm a front runner. Now, when I 
see this um, other firm for Modsil that will terrorise half the firms in the northwest. But they never terrorised us because we knew what they was about. So we would, I would go in first, then my hyenas would follow. When I say hyenas, these are like my best mates. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, what do you call it? I mean, Asher, who I loved, one of my partners, six foot two, hooligan, always there with me. At one time, I seen me, he said, Doyle, I'm at the side of you. What are you doing at the side of me? You should be in front of me. That's how it was. But then you, you're not, to, when you're talking about a pub fight, fit, um, what do you call it, a club fight, nobody will put a Budweiser down to, to hit somebody. That was the most common weapon on the planet was a Budweiser bottle in them days. Then people put out the shooters. I remember having an argument, massive, um, the day we done them in a pub in Salford. The next day, I... Um, what do you call it? A couple of shootings, a couple of people got legged off either way. Now, the next day, I'm arguing with massive lads, there's four cars of them. I've got a friend in my, this car, I'm standing at the back of the car arguing with massive lads, knowing nobody's going to shoot me above the waist because nobody got took out. They would only get legged off, so I'm, not, I'm standing where my legs are not seen. My mate, because he bottled it, Drove off. Oh, didn't it? But they knew because I've got seven brothers, mm -hmm. six brothers, one half brother. They knew that I can fill two cars. They knew if anything happens to me, they have to leave Salford. And not only did Massey have a fan club, I had a fan club. In fact, I had the biggest fan club because I could pull five of you sound stupid and pathetic, and I have done it and so is a lot of other my friends, we could pull 500 mates. We could pull 200 hooligans. And that's in these hooligans where we sang about in the 70s that looked the part where they said they looked like gangsters, all become gangsters. And one of them now is worth 30 million quid living in Dubai. Was there ever a moment in your life, like 20s, getting into your 30s, where you were ever happy that you were making money, you had a reputation, or was that always wanting more? always wanting more tons, always wanting more graft. Like, was there ever any moments that... I've, ne I've never been money oriented. I've never? Never. never. I've, I've counted money where, um, where it's been back aching, where you're counting nothing more as 20s with 20s, 10s with 10s, where, where it's, it hurts my back counting money. I've done money through um, counting machines. 90% if I'm telling people stories, it's not really about the money I've been earning. Now, when, um, more or less, when the Europe, when the race system come out, yeah, where this is, when I had that trouble with Massa, Massey's firm was the most feared in the Northwest, yeah. They had kids in that firm that, being shot above the waist just started to come out, yeah? The, the Noonans got charged, obviously they was not guilty, they got found not guilty for, for killing somebody, right? They got charged with that, acquitted, like we saw. Now, but after that murder, nobody knows who'd done it, after that murder, people started to forget about getting legged off. People started to get shot above the waist, yeah? So everyone accepts that. Everybody now, because even the drug scene started to come out, people started to sell weed here, there, and everywhere, right? Now, this firm, Massey's firm, was that ruthless. They even went to a guy that wouldn't sell weed to beat him up. The guy wasn't at home. There was a wallpaper man putting wallpaper up. They killed the wallpaper man. That's how barbaric this firm is. Right, so now this is the firm what I'm going against, and half the people hated them. Now I've got a problem with this firm. Then all of a sudden, from the biggest um, menace in Manchester at one time, these club owners are coming to me, saying to me, would I bar this firm from nightclubs? Now, if I've got this firm coming to me, I'm thinking, well, why not? Why not earn something? 
why not get myself out of the house without the missus going on at me, yeah? So I can then get out, be out to four or five in the morning, no problems. So that's what I did. I started to buy Massey's firm from most nightclubs. And that's where the the, 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 the door was, the Manchester door was. Really, the Manchester door was, was everybody against me. Now, one time there's a pub called the Inner Good Hope. And this pub called the, the Inner Good Hope, beautiful place. And um, I got asked from a friend to, to buy Massey's firm from it. Because they all used to go in with caps on, hoodies on, whatever. So they asked me, could I, this terrorised all the other customers in there, could I buy them? And I'll be on fantastic wages. So I said, right, no problem. My first night, I go down there. I'm working for somebody on the thing, yeah, getting paid. Then I go down there. There was, I'm not gay, but there's very handsome kid, 30 inch waist, 16 and a half stone on the door there called Graham Boardman. Right, talk, unbelievable. You'll think he was a professor. Now, when I first landed, he goes, oh, Paul, it's a pleasure to meet you. I've heard about your reputation, blah. Now, I was taught back by his mannerism. Little did I know, this guy is the biggest lunatic on the planet. Fantastic with the girls. Beauty, he charmed them, charmed anyone. But this night, we got told to buy a massive firm. There's another firm in there called the Ugly Firm. Skinheads was out in them days. They all skinheaded off. All, they suited the name, the Ugly Firm, because they was all ugly, bent noses. <laughs> uh, I could have been part of it. So <laughs> what happened was it ended up, this is in another part of Southern where everybody hates me. They was all leaving the place. One stopped and said, Doyle, what are you doing on here? Now, I'm not going to argue with anyone. I know what's going to come. So I unslaughtered him. These friends come running back in. As I'm unslaughting him, I'm looking at Graham and another kid called Alan Maloney massacring these other 10, 15 lads, just going through him like a, a knife in support, a hot knife in support. So many ran off. They come back and I'm thinking, wow, I'm expecting these two kids that spoke like gays, nothing against gays, but spoke like gays, to be done in. I was worried for them. But they massacred them, left bodies all over the car park. They've come back and you hurt, Paul. I said, no, is there any more of this scum in here? Then the, everybody in the pub started pointing the finger at me, thinking I put all these kids in the coma. Then the next day, Massey's firm, heard what happened to this ugly firm. I thought the ugly firm's a part of the area there from. 2040, um, 16 valve golfs, that's what everyone used to, Cosworths used to drive and all the gangsters, yeah? Pulled on the car park. Massey comes up, he said, Diary, you shouldn't be barring us from this place, you're a friend. So I, he just gave me a door to get out of. So I said, look, Massey, I said, I'm glad you said I'm a friend. I said, because, you should be saying to me, if you're a friend, we'll drink somewhere else and let you earn money in peace. I said, that's what you should be saying to me. He said, yeah, but your boss, who's employing you here, shouldn't be. He's no friend of mine. I've got another kid with me that wants him a one-to-one -one for 20 grand, right? So I turn around. This kid, what he wants a one-to-one -one with, is a big six-foot-four kid. It's more or less a straight member. He's got a security firm, just got a security firm with Gennardo for 250 grand, right? A contact with Gennardo and could have a proper read and write. But Queensbury's, yeah? So I said, look, I can't speak for this kid. So he turned around and said, right. He said, then we'll stay out of here for you, but we're not staying out of here for your boss, more or less. I won't say his name. So anyway, he said, will you tell him this kid wants him a fight? The six foot four kid come and he went like that to me. He said, what do you think you should do? So I said, well, you can't win. He said, what do you mean you can't, I can't win? He said, I'll fight the lad. He's a big, powerful lad, I'm a boxer. He said, you can't win. I said, the kid that wants you to fight, 
I was a very well-known Manchester family. I said, the kid who wants you to fight, I said, he will throw punches at you for 20 seconds, which I would do the same. After 20 seconds, he would know you're capable of taking these punches. It would, then it will start eyeballing up where you, you go for the eyes. I said, if that doesn't work, he'll throw you. He'll, he'll grip you up. He'll bite your vein out of your neck. I just said, and if that doesn't work, his friends that are there watching the fight will pull out the weapons. He said, in the early days, it'll be a knife, but now they'll be pulling out them. I said, no doubt, we will pull out them. He said, we'll be there. Well, he said, then you're going to have World War Three. He said, is it worth it over the inner good old? He said, because you've got a contract with Gennaro. Just accept the contract with Gennaro. You forget about masses for him, you're not going to win. So then he just said, yeah, you're right. Give it, not cowardice, he would have fought the lad, but he just couldn't have won. Then he said, yeah, you're right. So that's when me and Graham, this kid called Graham Boardman, become partners. We took over the security firm. And then the next thing that happened, then I realised how much of a psychopath he was. Which to everyone now, we've got a, a security firm where everybody wants us on their doors all the time. Yeah. So we started to write, to say on one occasion, with some, Graham was on the door, with somebody that's the double of me. Yeah. He was on the door there. And um, this was on a Thursday night at a nightclub. Seven lads come down and um, the place was empty. Graham said, um, you're not coming here, you've had too much to drink. So the kids said, um, he said, what? He said, I said, you've had too much to drink. So the kid said, look, he said, I used to be a doorman. And one thing I never did was growl because if I growl, now before he could finish the statement off, he was comatized. All seven was put in a coma besides one girl. Yeah, we was in the next day, we were charged with seven section 18s because these was all in a bad way. But then we were charged with, we had to go on the ID parade. None of them would turn up for the ID parade, only the girl, we had that information anyway. And in them days, we could, you could pick your ID parade. So I could have seven brothers on my ID parade. And she, you was allowed to do that. Now, but on this occasion, what we did, we got her next door neighbor on the ID parade just to show her we know where she lived. And obviously we never got paid mm -hmm. out. So, so that's Graham guy, like, like, who is he? You think he's a big fruity guy, big handsome guy, not going to back you up, but ends up a big part of your life, does he not? But he ends up he's an got absolute massive, limbo. He's got a massive part of my life. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, he's given me nightmares. <laughs> million percent no not my nightmares as in the way you would expect you've got an older story to understand the, the nightmares what he's given me right now I am a I am a, a Christian die hard Christian in the reform schools yeah because the Catholic reform schools don't forget we're going back to the Victorian era in these reform schools you, was, you had to go to church every morning. You, you did your bed, you make your bed, yeah? You, you went for breakfast, then you went for church. It was drummed into you, right? So I'm a die-hard Catholic, yeah? I believe in the power of the universe. Now, because could I went to church, I think I'm like surrounded. When I used to knock people out left, right and center, and I used to think to myself, why am I not receiving this? Why am I not getting this, yeah? Now, when I met Graham, when I met Graham, we, we went to, from a, that path to a different path. We had the gang warfares with Massey. Now, Massey, um, Graham started to get a very, very, very big reputation. Even Desi Noonan, um, turned around and said to one of his, his friends, you would fight Paul Doyle, yeah, because all you're going to do is get knocked out. 
yeah? He said, you fight Graham, you're just going to be coma-ized. You don't know what's coming. When I said to you that somebody would bite a vein out of somebody's neck, Graham would bite a vein out of somebody's neck. He would go through six or seven lads, like I said, like a knife through a ball. His reputation is unbelievable. Because he was a good-looking lad, nobody seen the fear. Nobody had fear factor for him and with the way he spoke. And then we was together. If I'm do, we're going on meetings to get... To, to have a chat with other criminals, everyone would think he's the brains and I'm the brawn. But he wasn't. I'm the streetwise kid and he's the brawn. He was, all I had to do was attack, move to one side. I didn't even have to help him out. It was that vicious. It was, un, it was untrue. He would have killed Lenny McLean. He would have done Lenny McLean. He knew every sort of martial art on the planet. He was the one that told me uh, he, he, one time uh, we used to have battles in, within the good hope against the rugby players. Now, one time, there was, uh, he showed me uh, how to do the throat move, yeah? So for a month, instead of doing the way I punch, I was just practicing the throat move where you go down, bang, yeah? So then, for, months, he, for a month, he's showing it me. This would be player... Um, started one night, six foot four, standing in front of me, said to me, I was arguing with another rugby player, tapped me on the shoulder, said, don't be arguing with me, him, argue with me. So I looked up, looked up, there was a big pal, throated him, down, gasping for breath. Now the, the whole hospital was 300 yards away. We had to put him in the back of the car, take him to hospital. If the whole hospital would have been two miles away, he would have been dead. You had to put the tube at the back of the throat to, to keep him alive. And that's how dangerous that move is. Now, Graham showed me that, and he had moves after moves after move, but it was so psychotic, it was unscrewed. Now, because we had problems with Massive Firm and all the other stuff, that at the same time, the, the, the world blossomed on ease and cannabis, right? Sniff wasn't really out. The cocaine wasn't really out. Just that half the planet, what it was, cannabis and ease. And the, the, the European drug laws knew it had a problem. And the problem was, well, we used to say, like, cause we're connected, yeah? And we used to get our stuff from the people what I was in the proof schools with, scousers, that I've spent time with. In the reform schools, 60%, no, 80% of the lads in the reform schools were scousers. They had the same genetics as us. So when we come out, we still had a bond with them. So we got our cannabis from them. We was lucky. But the white community couldn't go to these places like Moss Side or Liverpool because they would have the money took off and they'd be taxed, yeah? So the European drug laws knew there was a problem to get their stuff sold to the white community. So they got every hard nut, everybody with a reputation, to set up shop around, say, areas, Manchester, Salford or whatever, to start selling. So because we, we had them gang warfare on the door walls with near enough everyone. Our reputation blossomed, mine and Graham's. More, more so, everybody knew for years what I was about. All of a sudden, people understand what Graham was about. He was a psychopath, yeah? So then we went over to, we got called over after collecting a bit of a debt to see a guy in Amsterdam. We had, um, the business class can't get to Amsterdam, you can't get first class. Business class, five-star hotel to stay in. We had everything paid for us to meet this guy. Now, all I, I had a round of about 20 key of cannabis sold every week. So all I wanted was to be able to buy 20 key of cannabis. But anyway, we go over there, met this guy, six foot four, yeah, straight away, he had the same sort of image as Graham, at the time, a good-looking guy, yeah, suave, 
Italian suit. We met him in the hotel. Because of the way Graham was, the way he spoke, he was sucking by that. And be, because of the way I look and uh, my mad reputation, what I had, that was fearless reputation, he was also took in for that. Graham wouldn't go to the next level. I was more or less drilled to go to that level, just like a lot of other people uh, went through what I went through. Now, when we met him, we that night he soon got us in the Five Star Hotel. We had a little drink with him. He said, look, I'm not going to talk business now. He said, well, I'm going to take you on a meeting at night time. I went on a meeting at night time with, um, what, how old am I now? Just over 30. Graham's still in his late 20s. No, I've gone over there and he's saying, look, we need you. He was saying, the boss, we need you to sell the shop about England. He said, I've got a slaughter. Do you know what a slaughter is? Yeah. A warehouse mm -hmm. to send stuff to in Manchester. But we haven't really got anyone to sell it. He said, we need you to set up shop around Manchester. Not only will we feed you, we will feed our own friends around the north. So I'm thinking, like, yeah, we'll blossom on that. He took us to meet the Dutch guys. He said, this is Paul Graham, who's collect kind of collected a debt for 200 grand for him. He said, this is Paul Graham, who collected the debt for us. He said, Paul knows all the different foods. He was building us up on a pedestal. Yeah, I wanted 20 k. He said, Paul can sell our stuff for us. He said, he will receive it at the slaughter, blah, blah, blah. Now, we got offered uh, two ton of cannabis. Yeah, I only wanted 20 k. <laughs> and uh, something like two ton of whiz. Yeah, exactly. I nearly burst out laughing with my tears. Yeah. So I'm thinking, God, what have I stepped into? So I said, look. I want to tell to the boss, can I have a word with you? Outside the pub, I said, look, I can't sell this amount. I want it 20 gig. He said, don't worry, because you're getting it that cheap. Now, if you was to get a key of um, cannabis, it was before skunk come out. Cannabis is out the hard yeah. stuff, yeah? If you was to get a key of cannabis, you'd be lucky to make 20 pound on it. But in them days, you could make 300 pound on it. So you'll get it 300, 200 pound cheaper, right? Because they're getting, you see, they're getting half of it laid on, right? From the Yugoslavs, whatever, the Moroccans. Now, this guy also had a problem with the Moroccans. So anyway, but on this deal, we agreed that we would receive all the cannabis, yeah? And all the whiz, but the whiz got sent to his shop where people was already set up on it. So we are receiving the cannabis. Now, later that night, after we'd made a deal, he, more or less the champagne come out because he was on fortunes. This one night, he, he spent about 160,000 guilders, which is, um, it, was, it was just four to one in the pound then, guilders, but still massive amount of money, celebrating, right? Christmas has come for him. God knows what he was earning. Now, he turned around, this smart guy who's slick as slick as anything, he said to me, he said, Paul, he said, we know everything about you. Yeah. He said, we know everything about Graham. He said, but, he said, we like people that walk straight. He said, them that walk crooked will die. Yeah. So I'm thinking, fucking hell, what's this about? Them that walk crooked will die. Because I'm not a drinker. I, what do you call it, this night I was drinking, it gets rid of all my shyness. Normally I don't talk. It gets rid of all my shyness. So I, so I gave it the Al Pacino bit and said, look, I'm not scared of dying, but I don't walk crooked. And he goes, he said, yeah, I'm like you, Paul. He said, I'm not scared of dying, but the last, but there's a million ways to die. And I'm thinking, fucking hell, what's this about? That's what that. So he showed me then something that was unbelievable. He showed me a picture with a head on a plate, a head on a plate with an apple in its mouth. The head, you couldn't even tell it was a head. No eyes, no ears, no nose, no lips. 
on the apple shop, you said you end up like a pig. I'm thinking, fucking hell. But I was thinking in my head, who's gave this guy this pizza? Where did he get this pizza from? Yeah, because it was like one of them, you know, pizzas that come yeah. out straight away. The film comes out and yeah. see the yeah. picture. It was, it was mm -hmm. one of the thinking, who's give this guy this picture? Not realising he took this picture himself. It's one of his victims, yeah? So now I'm thinking, yeah, but I'm a grafter. Who cares, right? But I had a funny feeling in my head. Right? And I was saying, look, this sounds weird, you know, to Graham. But Graham was thinking about the power notes, right? Now, I was thinking at the time, I'm in my 30s, thinking it's going to this life now, I've stepped in to the premiership. This is the premiership. Forget everything else. This is more or less what I've set my career out to be, where I want to be, yeah? Besides the end, I'm not thinking about, I'm thinking now I can get away from the gang wars. I can, all I can do now is feed everyone, be everyone's mate, be the man at the top, drive nice cars, because in them days only criminals drove nice cars. You didn't have to hide anything. Like everyone knew what always was anything. If somebody said to, um, went to the police and said, Paul Doyle is selling drugs, the police will say, don't we think we know that? How can we get him? Tell me how we can get him. That the, the, the police are on us. I had that many operations on me, they were bumping into each other's. Yeah, but I'm thinking this is the way out. So when I come back to England to start work on the two tonne of cannabis, I, had to, I ended up with about 400 key myself to sell to friends. All the rest went out to the boss's friends all around the north, right? And so did the whiz. He did the whole whiz. So then, after we getting, you used to say, like, you've got to go out of town phone box. We used to call the office. It's not like mobiles now. So you used to go to out of town phone box, give them a one bell. They'll phone back and you have a chat. So then he'll take you turn around and say, get over here as fast as you can. Before he even started talking, saying everything's gone, we're just waiting for the money to come in. Everything was laid on in them days. You know what I mean by laid on? Yeah. Yeah. On tech. Yeah, on tech. So in them days, everything was laid on. So you'll give them like 10 days to pay. Then you'll send the money out. Then the next shipment will be coming in within 14 days. So it's every two weeks. It carries on. So anyway, he said, come over here. So I'm thinking, right, it must be to talk about the money, blah, blah, blah. So then we've gone over, met him. Oh, he said, don't come by plane, drive over. So we drove over to see the boss. We get there. He phoned, he phoned us a pair of, what do you call it? A spanner each, give us a spanner each. So I'm thinking, God, what's this about? This is what I've dreamt about getting away from that, shutting the door on that, and um, just carry on earning money, what it's about. It's not about the violence no more, I was thinking. He said, right, I'm having a meeting with some Moroccans, and he said, and these Moroccans, I've got a problem with, something happened, I ended up finding out, he ripped them off for a million and a half quid. That's why he's doing so well. He spent a million and a half quid, most probably worth seven million now. So. I went to, um, I was in the back of the car, all spanned up. Graham had a spanner, but he's never even, the only thing Graham could do with his spanner is look at himself if it's shiny. He wouldn't, wouldn't think he's a fire. So anyway, so I'm um, in the back of the car thinking, now, am I ever going to get away from this? Right, ill with talking to myself inside my head, gutted. Then I have to accept in my head, in that back of the car, it is what it is, I am what I am, and it doesn't matter about, I'm most probably accepted, that through my life, I'm never gonna be away from it. So then I've accepted that yet again, I could be took out, life sentence. So we go on the meeting, six or seven Moroccans there, he's chatting over about the whip, arguments each way. A guy, big powerful guy, kept an eyeball in me. The argument got vicious. The big powerful guy thing there, plugged, like shot two of them, out of annoyingness, more or less, because I knew it, the door wasn't gonna get shut on violence, 
right? So I took it out in the two my lockers. I had to get a taxi to Belgium, right? then a train to France, back over here, and Graham, and we got another lad, a boxer, bodyguarded him. Graham started bodyguarding the boss, right? Because now it's on top proper. But Graham's fearless. The bodyguard we sent over, the Irish lad, wasn't, wasn't shy. So then the next thing is, we've realised that this guy, that the picture, what he's shown me, is one of his victims. He's, he's just like a psychopath, where Graham's a psychopath on violence. This guy's a psychopath on that. He, his victims never get the privilege of a bullet. You, the drilled, it's like um, where we've been cloned for the battlefield, but what he gets up to is not in the real book. Torture. Worse than it, they sexually abuse you. They burn your testicles off. They'll cut your lips off to pull your teeth out. They'll, they'll, they, they won't allow you to die. You'll be, when you start getting cut, you'll be thinking to yourself, now I would most probably die of a heart attack because I wouldn't know what was coming. But you would think to yourself, thank God, because I most probably won't have long. They're, they're just barbaric, right? Then there was, uh, what do you call it? Graham and um, the other lad was over there all the time. Now, what happened was, he, um, me and um, a world champion boxer at the time, and another lad, a friend of mine, we was all pulled in on a murder charge over here. We never did it, but we was pulled in on it, right? By the time we ate the trial, before trial began, we had our charges dropped. They found the proper killer, yeah? Now, I went over to, to talk about what's being spent, blah, blah, blah. While my two partners, Graham and the Irish kid, was over there, they started to all get a reputation around Holland, more so the boss, how vicious and what they're capable of with um, other firms. So everyone started to, to come to them. This guy was known about his uh, firm behind himself. So he is capable of done 36 murders, this guy, all right? But this is our firm behind him he was cloning them to do whatever, and these would do whatever. Now, on one occasion, there was a, a Colombian guy, a Colombian guy, and he um, he was old, the son of a Colombian cartel. This son is like, his dad most probably on another level, but he's most probably a spoiled brat. He's not capable of nothing. So he goes to the boss and says, look, I'm old two million guilders. So the boss turned around and said, right, we'll collect the debt for half price. The next thing is, Graham comes back to England, said that he has to give him so much out the boss's money because what him and the boss done. They tortured some poor guy to death for the two million guilders, yeah? I go over there and now I know what this guy's about. I go over, and uh, he's talking about, there's a guy, a Geordie kid, who owes him 300,000 pound. On this night out, like I don't drink, so I'm th th on there. The ball. Yeah, I'm all, always on the ball, yeah? So he's sniffing whatever, partying, and he's talking now what he's gonna do to the Geordie kid who's not paid the 300,000 pound, how he's gonna cut his lips off. This is what I, what I said, this is where it's all come from this night how he's going to cut his lips off, drill him, burn his testicles off, the whole scenario. So then he said, the next day I'm thinking, thank God I'm going home, right? And I don't have, I know the Geordie kid, one of the typical Geordies from the eighties. He's got tattoos on his face, all that sort of crap. So the next thing is, he said, Paul, you're going, you're going home today. This is on the Sunday. So I said, yeah, he said, do us a favor. When our car drops you off, right, drops us off at the airport, get the Geordie kid and bring him to the car. So I'm thinking, God, I've got to send, send this Geordie kid to the worst thing, death on the planet. 
Yeah, so the Geordie kid comes as doily, happy as the day is long. So he said, I said, look, get back on the plane and go. Because you, if you stay here, you're going. Going where? I said, going. Gone. He said, I don't know what you mean. I said, look, do we have to spell it out? You're gone, never to be seen again. Your mother's not even going to bury you. Right? So then he realised, got back on the plane. I come home. I was just going to pretend that he never got off the plane. I come home. Then I get a phone call. And he said, right, get to the office, out of town phone box. I, the boss gets, speaks to me, he said, you grassing bastard. So I said, what do you mean a grassing bastard? He said, you told the Geordie kid that he was going. So then I knew, I then told him, I said, look, I'm not capable of what you're, I don't mind doing whatever and somebody going on the battlefield. It's a battle. They accept that. Because on our level, you would accept that, whatever. I said, but to go that way, I said, you would give me nightmares forever and a day. I said, I'm not capable of that. He ate me, right? So after he spat, he's done me out a bit. So he half accepted. Now, Graham was back over then, then with the other kid. The other kid, the Irish kid, come over here to do the Geordie anyway. Yeah, he ended up going to Geordie, right? For Did not he end up dying anyway? Yeah, he ended up dying anyway, Shit. right? Then... I'm over there. So I get for thinking because of the argument. You're next. Yeah, I've got, I'm spanned up. Mm -hmm. Thinking like half ready that the boss is going to go if he makes one wrong move or whatever. Now that night, with the people we're, we're with are not uncouth. The businessmen. They're the businessmen from England. So one of them would, um, to open a warehouse, will take six months. He'll go in the bank. He's got to sit with a banker. He's got to open a, a business company. They're all suave. They're all suited and beauty. The proper businessmen uh, get paid well, right? So then we're all on a night out. Yet again, I'm sober, right? And I don't do the brass. My generation think it's non-sifying to go with. It sounds it's like you know, non-sifying to have to pay for it, yeah? So at the end of the night, everyone's, all of them a bit drunk on the sniff, decide to go to a, a prostitute, a brothel. We go in this brothel, a 10 out of 10 brothel, big, gorgeous women there, but there's a screen that's showing Brazilian models on the catwalk, right, in bikinis. So I'm chilling with my Diet Coke, just watching the models, waiting for them to finish doing what they were doing, all my friends, because I'm driving everyone because I'm the only one that's sober. So the next thing, a bird comes, sits next to me. I said, um, do, 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 can we buy a drink? Look, I'm happy being here by myself, go away, yeah? Another bird comes, go away. The next thing, another bird comes, do us a favor, F off. So then the two doormen come, the two doormen come, with the boss, one big potato-headed guy comes, the boss is like that. He said, what are you doing telling my women to F off? So I said, look, I said, I'm just enjoying a diet coke, what I've paid too much for. I said, just think I just want to be left alone. I'm waiting for my mates to finish doing what they're doing. Then I'll go. He said, no, you go now because the thing here. I said, I'm not going anywhere, mate. The potato head stood forward, pulled the spanner out. Do you want to go? Do you want to go now, right? The boss runs out naked. Graham runs out, right? Oh, I didn't know he was with you, so the boss slaps the bird. Don't bother him again. Well, anyway, long story short, I go home the next day. The boss then phones me up and says, why did you have the gun? So I said, what do you mean, why did he have the gun? I said, oh, just, it was dangerous in them days. I said, I've shot two Moroccans. It can happen to me any time. I said, you know what owns that? He said, no, you had that gun for me. I said, I didn't, I'm not going to own up to anything, yeah? I said, no, I didn't have that, you're paranoid. He said, no, you had that gun for me. So we started to argue a little bit, yeah? But he was right, but I'm not admitting it, yeah? Graham comes back, then the next thing, the boss gets arrested for all the, 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 the stuff what was going on, people getting shot every other week. 
people getting killed. He was arrested for all the drugs of what was sent over. Now, the week before he got arrested, he had two ton of uh, cannabis come over and two ton of whiz, like always. He gives everything out to his customers and I, I sell my own, yeah? So then he's locked up. Now, in, over in um, Amsterdam in them days, they used to bag you up. So you could be stood at a bar, the police will come in, put a bag over your head. You don't even know it's the police. I think they play that game. Take you to the high, the biggest, highest police station going. You not you don't even see a sweaty so for a month, nothing. It's barbaric, like they did in this country years ago. Then what happened then is, the more or less, he was wanted for, in this country for two murders. The English didn't even want him. Right now, if I was here away in Holland and I got done for shoplifting, they would bring me back here and throw me in jail. For some reason, they didn't want him, right? And that's when I knew he could have been an informer or he made a deal with the police. So then, when he come out, he, they, they asked him what country he wants to go to. He went to Ireland, yeah? He went to Ireland, he phoned me up. He said, have you got uh, my money? Because of the cannabis I was selling. So I said, yeah, he said, how much have you got? I said, I've got like two and a half hundred thousand. It could have been a bit more, I don't know. He said, no, Paul, you've got like um, two, two and a half mil, three mil. So I said, what are you talking about? He said, the whiz. Now the whiz was laid on to him from the Yugoslavs. So I said, I don't owe for the whiz. You give it to your customers. He said, no, could it come through our slaughter, what I picked up from? He said, no. You pick the stuff up. Now, he would have been taping me. I said, are you mad? I said, I went to name people. I'll give it to him. He said, I don't know none of them. Did he tape all your calls? But he did, yeah. He's, he's the most devious, midnight, uncouth bastard you'll ever meet. So, but he's suave. Now, one time, I would have stood in front of him if he was getting shot at, yeah? So then, he goes like that. He told the Yugoslavs, because they took everything off him, he told the Yugoslavs, we've ripped him. So he'll collect all the money from his customers. Then he would tell the Yugoslavs, we've ripped. They've come for us thinking that he's not had it. So you're talking about 3 million quid, which is like 15 million now, maybe more. So now the Yugoslavs are on the Yugoslav mafia is on the phone to me. Right, so we had a, um, what do you call it, argument. Graham was more or less saying, see the boss, he's the one who's ripped, not us. And he's saying, no, he wouldn't have ripped because he's done us favours. Do you know where the, um, like, um, the Colombian guy he had to collect debt for? He's most probably done favours like that. So he's saying, no, you've had it. So the next thing, I had my own builder's yard in them days, earning good money, blah, blah, blah. And I was also, I don't mind getting myself dirty, but getting involved with the lads. So I was working at the builder's yard, a car pulled up, two big heavy cockneys there. It's them, because they were so filthy and working, they thought I was just a worker. They said, go and get your boss. I said, what do you mean, go and get the boss? He said, um, we're here to see your boss. So he said, who? He said, Doyle. So I thought, oh, give him the thing that, now I was always like, span it up because I knew what was coming. Yeah, I knew what was coming. It's because the arguments I've had on the phone. So I've come back, legged one, shouldered the other, took the watches off him. Then Yugoslavs washed their hands with us. They knew that Salford wasn't a place to step into. Yeah. So then the other guy, the boss, still having arguments. Him and Graham now are going at each other. Yeah, him and Graham are going at each other both arguing, saying what they're going to do to each other, how they're going to do it, blah, blah, blah. That's not in the rule book. So the next thing you know is, at the same time, Graham bought into a, a nightclub called The Temple. Five, now, we've given up the doors, not interested in his money to be earned elsewhere, right? And we're, we're doing well. Earning, like I said, it earned my back counting money. Right, but I'm a gambler. I was also throwing it on the roulette tables. Right, the next thing is him and Graham are going on at each other. 
how are they going to kill us both? Blah, blah, blah. But because at the same time, Graham, and I forgot about this, Graham the, um, has an argument with a, the, um, a ticket, the um, parking on double yellow lines, a traffic warden. He runs, tries to run over the traffic warden, the traffic warden jumps on the bonnet, goes down the road with him, 60 miles an hour, pulls up, he rolls off, Graham gets 18 months. Right, so the, this firm, Morris's, um, the boss's firm, he then brings pe other people to come at us. I then surrounded myself with hooligans that look like gangsters that are all ready to budweiser whoever comes through the door. Look in the park, start everywhere I went, I'm standing 80 strong, 100 strong before cameras come out. When I walked to a club, when I walk to a club and there's a queue outside, all the doormen will push the queue back and just allow us to walk straight through. We had a run of every club in Manchester. We even started to, um, the VIP part in a club called Kells, where we were drinking with all the footballers, Beckham, Giggsy, Gary Neville, Smichael. I've named one of my sons Smichael. There's a picture of, yeah, beautiful. He's even got blonde there. There's a picture of Smichael on Peter Smichael's knee when he was um, one years of age. Yeah, so we had it boxed off. Ned Kelly, Ned Kelly used to pay us money, so we, uh, he's done his cure at Old Trafford, so nothing, has to, nothing happens to the players. We had it totally boxed off, the whole of Manchester. So anybody outside Manchester knows they couldn't come in and the, um, to do me. So I stood strong. Graham come out of prison. He didn't want to go back. That was his first where I was bred into it. And there was no fear factor with me. There was a fear factor with Graham. He hated it. He scared behind. him. Pardon? Did it scare him? He couldn't handle it. It's yeah. most, it's most, I mean, the prison's uncouth. Mm -hmm. Mad that, and that big strong man who could fight anybody, but being caged up like an animal. It... Yeah, well, his brother was a professor. Mm -hmm. He wasn't cloned for that. Mm -hmm. He was cloned to chatting up women, he brutalised women. He was cloned for, for the freedom. He liked going on walks. He knew, he liked going to the gym. He knew every martial art on the planet. He was on, but he was psychotic. If he was a fantastic footballer, he was um, a professional footballer, but he beat, him, he beat half his own team up. Mm -hmm. If he was playing football, he did a bad pass. Graham get a grip of your game, he will slap himself. Like he, was, he was a lunatic, but 16 and a half stone lunatic. Now, what happened was he come out and um, he, he bought into a nightclub called The Temple. He owed 1,400 ravers, earning fantastic money, doing the door. There was one firm coming, bad, you're not allowed in. So this firm, what do you mean we're not allowed in? He slaps them all about. On the way back to the car, Five of them stupidly jumped him. Now, they was found in bushes. One of them had the cheekbone bit out, yeah? The next day, the police go through the door, right? Go through his door and he um, took his bite sample. DNA? You did, no, each person has a, a different bite. Teeth, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they took his um, bite sample. I think it was, how they did it, I don't know. So he was given bail, right? Now, in, just before this, he attacked the five guys, right? just before he attacked the five guys and he got out of prison, he was like a new man. When he got out of prison, I gave him, the, the, the weekend he got out, I gave him 300 grand with what I've earned while he's away for him, his share, yeah? So I gave him 300 quid. Now, normally, if somebody gives me 300 quid, I'll, what he caught, I'll be over the moon, cuddling him or whatever. He decided to go off to London. He wouldn't get involved in the graft because he, he was scared of the prison, what was what it was about. So he got himself and he wanted to distance himself from me because I was grafting and um, what I was doing. So he got himself a new set of friends. One of the friends was a, a world champion kickboxer and one was, um, he called SAS guy, SAS Jerry, right? That's his nickname, not his proper name, his nickname, SAS Jerry, right? So 
when he said, come and meet my friends, the other kids, you know, go down and meet him. So I've gone down in the middle of the day for something to eat with him to meet his new friends. Now, his new friends are like that. He said, we've got a hit on you. Yeah, don't forget, he's SAS, and now there's a hit on me through the boss because of shooting the, the, the Yugoslavs, big heavies from London, whatever, and having it was the bosses, some of the bosses' friends, yeah? So there is a hit on us. And also Graham, because Graham argues with the boss left, right and centre. So then, oh, in the meantime, two of the people we've worked with have gone over to Ireland to see the boss. They've never been seen again. They've gone. One even went with the wife, gone. She's gone. Gone, yeah. Brutal, right? But hopefully they've gone the easy way. Now then, yeah, it's, it sounds it sounds that it sounds stupid. Like, uh, it sounds like a mad, mad film. Yeah, but... It, it sounds like a Quentin Tarantino thing, like fucking, um, like a Kill Bill, uh, what was the film on the Reservoir Dogs? When they're all getting tortured, coppers are getting shot. Well, to believe it or not, the guy in Reservoir Dogs which um, cuts the ear off, yeah? He half looks like this guy in his younger days. And that's how mad that is. It's one million percent. And if you, I could not say if, um, in the younger, say in the younger days, if I, when I was in um, Lindor, and I would say to somebody, oh, I was walking to the, uh, this nightclub, and somebody started on me and knocked him out, then I went to two doormen, knocked the two doormen out, then I went in the bar, not the guy in the bar out. People think, what planet are you on? Not knowing I'm more or less connected out to throw punches, right? Because it's easier to knock a man out in one punch than it is with the second. So anyway, so what happened was he, I meet the SAS guy and the world champion boxer. So he said, we've got a hit on you. So I said, what do you mean you've got a hit on us? He said, off the Yugoslavs. Now everyone thought we did a rip on the boss. Nobody hardly knew about the Yugoslavs, but I thought Graham must have told him. So he just went over my head, right? So then the SAS guy turned around and said, he said, look, um, he said, the hardest thing, when this, I'm having something to eat with a friend, Ted. he said, the hardest thing is when you're torturing somebody, is to keep them alive. Don't um, let them die of a heart attack. You can't go too heavy too first. We scratch the bones. I said, listen, mate. I said, I'm having my food. I said, you're putting me off my dinner. What planet are you on? Then, you, then he goes, uh, oh, I could shoot somebody from 300 yards away. I said, listen, I'll shoot somebody from a yard away. Big thrill. Shut up, mate. Let me finish my thing. Then I said to Graham, they're ticks then. Right? I said, what planet are they living on? Right? So then... I didn't like them, and Graham knew it, but Graham didn't like my friends because there was hooligans on Coof, yeah? Where, where he thinks that everybody are on the same level, but so what if they all go in at the same time? There's nothing to blossom in a one-to-one. -one. He, Graham's a one-to-one -one and capable of it, but where everyone that's a hooligan would go in at the same time. And I prefer to be the other one. Yeah, because I know the odds are in my favour. So anyway, so the next thing is, I didn't get on with these friends. Graham beats up, like I just said, the five people at jumping, set by samples, didn't want to go back to prison, had a fair factor with prison. So the SAS guy turns around and said, I've got a place where you can go and stay at in Spain. Now, we think... The boss can't go to Spain because he still got a problem with the Moroccans he ripped off and two of them have been shot. Yeah? Do you remember me saying that? Yeah. He thinks we think we can't go to Spain. Graham goes to Spain. Now this the boss, we didn't know, has sorted out with the Moroccans, right? But he didn't want to go straight in for Graham because he wants me as well. Now, they're feeding Graham with women. Graham was mad about the women. Yeah, they're feeding him with women. They're saying to me, go over there. You can, like, Graham, you can party. Well, I said, this is the guy I don't like, the SAS guy. 
I said, why should I go over there? He said, I'm a Salford kid. I can get Salford girls. So what if they've got mum and dad tattooed on their abs? So what? <laughs> yeah, right. I am what I am. I prefer to take out a Salford girl in an AI class, right? And I won't have to pay for it. So then they've gone like that. So they know I'm not going to go over there for, for the women. So then the next thing that happened is they said to me, like Paul, he said, we, we can get as much cannabis over here as possible through the Moroccans. We know the best Moroccan boss of all time that was supplier, cartel sort of guy. So I said, so I turned around and said, how much is it? Now at the time it was, cannabis was going for 1400 pound, yeah? He said to me, we can get it for 400 pound. This is in Spain. Now normally, the, everyone started to get it from Spain then. Normally in the earlier days, you got it from Holland. And if you was to buy a ton, you got a ton laid on. If you buy 20k, you got 20k laid on. So Spain was a new thing. So I said 400k. Now I had a friend who, who was in Barcelona, a Cockney guy. Cockneys only care about money. The Northerners are violent. Everything, they want to prove a point and tell what people are capable of. Cockneys are different click. They're just worried about the paperwork. They forget about the virus unless they're drunk. Yeah, they're all game, but they want the potatoes. So the next thing is, he's like that, it's a certain price. So I phoned my friend in Barcelona. I can get the call it wood. I can get the wood for like um, 400 quid. He said, you're full of shit. I said, what do you mean I'm full of it? He said, you can't, you can't even buy it in Morocco at that price. He said, then you've got to get it to Spain, get it from Spain, get it over to England, Right, and he said, and then you, it was going to cost you like 900 pounds to a grand in England. Right, so I said, right, right. So I, Graham said, we can get, so I said, no, Graham, it's full of it. It's impossible, I've just been told. So a couple of weeks passes, Graham gets on to me, he said, Paul, please meet the SAS guy. So I said, there, I said, Graham, he's full of it. He said, please, he's got me a place to stay. Just have a chat with him, right? So I say, I agreed to meet the SAS guy on this graft, bringing cannabis back here. So I met him outside um, a famous pub in Hale. This pub has, um, has tables, like uh, summer tables in the back of the garden, right? A bench, so a seat here, table, seat there, right? He gets the drinks in, the SAS guy, comes and sits right next to me. And I'm thinking, God, what's this about? Is it gay? What, what is, why is this on? Normally, two it, guys it face to face, yeah. yeah? Not next to each other, near enough rubbing knees. So I'm thinking, wow. So he said, look, Paul, you're the last thing to the puzzle. He said, you can put the jigsaw together. So I said, what are you on about? He said, we can get the cannabis. He said, we can bring it to England. He said, what we need you is to sell it. He said, you know every firm on the planet. He said, you, all you have to do is make phone calls, it's gone. So I said, I know that. I said, but your stuff is um, too cheap. It's either snide or it's a rip. I said, it ain't gonna happen. He said, no, I know it is. He said, the, 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 the Moroccan cartel guy wants 400 pound. He said, but we know what the price is over here. He said, the price is £1,400. He said, he wants the £400 on half the shipment. He said, the other half the shipment, he wants £1,400. Now that puts the stuff in the Moroccans' favour. So I'm thinking now, he could be right. This could be happening, right? So he said, do you think, he's got me now, mentally. He said, do you think you could sell it? So I turned around and said, at that price, I will sell 20 ton a month, not a problem, right? So he said, well, there you go. He said, right, what we've done, we've got your business class to go over to Spain and we've got your five-star hotel to stay in. Now, when I first met the boss, he bought me a business class to go to Spain and a five car. And I'm thinking, is this Dave RV? <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Something wasn't right. And I looked down on the table and between us, they were, don't forget, I'm talking mid-90s. 
like it is now. A bug could be a little button there. But now, I look down, there's a wallet between us. On this wallet, it had a badge, right? So I'm thinking the badge stuck out like, a, like about a seven, so many centimetres, whatever. So I'm thinking, oh my God, he's bugging me. He's taping me. This is the reason we so close. I, he's taping me. Now, when you're being taped, you're thinking Dibble. You're thinking the coppers. And I've always just said to him that um, I can sell 20 ton a month. You're done, bank your rates. Yeah, so I've walked straight into a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, Paul, get your head together. Say, get, get yourself out of this. So then I've gone like that. I said, you know Paul Massa? So he looks at me confused. He said, I've heard of him. I said, well, Paul Massey's Manchester, Mr. Big. I said, right, we so. I said, he clicks his fingers, there's 200 lads there. And I said, they're all a pair to stand in front of him. I said, every cop in the Northwest wants to um, arrest him. So he could pill, pin up on the wall, I'm the man who got Mr. Big in Manchester arrested, right? And to prevent that, Paul Massey smokes a 20 pound weed every week. I said, I'm the same as Massey. I don't smoke a weed, but this is what I said. I'm the same as Massey. I said, I'll smoke a 20 pound weed every week. I said, have you got a 20 pound weed on you? So he goes, no. I said, well, good, don't bother me then. I said, forget about your fancy set, 20 ton here and 20 ton there, and a drug lord and a cartel. What planet are you on? Don't phone me again, I'm off. So I realized then, I phoned Graham. I said to Graham, right, because they're now in front. So it's like, when I left him, it was 10 o'clock. So it's 11 o'clock in Spain. I said, Graham, he's a cop of him. So he goes, don't be stupid, boy. I said, Graham is a cop. He's just been trying to take me. So he said, you're being stupid. He knew he wasn't a cop, boy, and he wasn't. So I said, well, why would he take me then? I said, if he's, um, what do you call it? If he's taping me and he's not a cop, he'll be taping me for the other firm. So he said, look, I'll speak to you in the morning. Now, by the time I was half an hour from home, by the time I got home, they knew, right, it would take me minutes to work everything out, right? So then they realised that I would have sussed it all out, that he wasn't a copper, that he was working for the boss, and uh, they wanted, not only did they want Graham, they wanted me as well. I've sussed it out not to go over there, so they would have known I would have warned Graham and let him through the net, and that's when 10 of them walked in on him, and they, um, they talked him into death for three days. Burnt his testicles off like up and turn finger, like what I said. How was it when you heard Graham was killed? No, me, I could um I could have a brother who I love. I love all my brothers. Yeah. And um many friends. I've had friends, I've had a meeting with seven lads. I'm the only one who's not been murdered. Believe it or not, Massey was the last one to be murdered out of the, the the seven. I'm part of the seven, by the way, and you, um, what do you call it? Now, whoever dies on the battlefield, you can accept that um, they've accepted that battlefield. They've accepted you live by the sword, you go by the sword. But the way Graham went, like I said before, was it in the rule book? Now, when I said that I have nightmares, now, when the, I got a message, when they did, like, Graham, they, they said to me, Graham paid his debt. I'm going to pay the same debt. Now, I have no fear factor of what they call it, facing whoever. Yeah, I've survived this long. Now, what do you call it? I'm five years away from 70. So in my head, I've swam the channel to get to this age. It was intimate at one time that I was going to go. At one time, I wouldn't even go to the gyms because it was pointless to look good for the slab. Because it was intimate because I'm going against the organisation. And every time this um, organisation was on the phone to me, they got what I was trying to do. I, they got the F word every time. You know, it didn't bother me giving whoever. So what? But when they, what do you call it? I've had nightmares of what Graham last thoughts were, how humiliating they made him feel, what they did, it's just not acceptable. Doesn't matter what criminal you are, 
to go down the um, to go down the lines is just not acceptable. Mm. What happened after that then? Well, what, what happened after that? I had to stand strong. If I went into hiding, if I went into hiding, and um, they would put a private investigator on me because these kids are worth millions, millions, and they won't count the money. They'll have somebody else hurting the back counting the money. And then. Well, they would put a private investigator on me as I'm thinking I'm hiding and um, feeling safe, somebody will come and do whatever, right? But I um, decided that I'm going to stand strong, stand surrounded with a firm. Whoever wants to come, I'm ready. I'll stand in front. And, um, when I was, um, say, at night time, if I'm home, I used to uh, have a window there, a cold of sat there, yeah, have a window there. I used to always have my chair there, watch the television, um, watch out for the fast cars, the 16 valves in them days past. Now, normally, if you're going through somebody's door, you would drive round, drive round again, third time, you're in the door, yeah? And you would be full of beans, right, coming through the door. Now, in your house, you couldn't be spanned up because the Dibble would put you away for five years. So what I used to do in the hallway, I had a little bar, neat height. So as they're running in full of beans, they'll be tripping up. My rock liars will be on them. I'll be on them. Is that the like, hard rock whalers? Oh yeah, beautiful oh, dogs. I've got. Oh, best dogs yeah, on the planet. Yeah. yeah. So They're that was your plan, survival mode, just to, to try and get percentages to survive, basically? It wasn't just a plan, it was, um, Jesus, how, how can you say, it sounds so pathetic. It was would have also been a kick. Mm -hmm. Well, one time, me and um, Graham, one time, I know I'm going back so many years before Graham left, the more or less towards the end of the door was, me and Graham was arguing with some of Manchester's finest, a couple of the Noonans, Massa, and he said, Paul, he said, we've been asked in this club, which was the temple, yeah? He said, then um, they give the door to use, right? So I, so me being, what I, I was sick to death of the doors because I was earning good money on the drugs, yeah? I didn't have to do the doors now. So I turned around and said, you can have the temple, right? I didn't know Graham owned the half the temple, but I turned around and said, you can have the temple. So, um, so Graham said, oh, no, no, no. He said, I've, this is right to Desi Nuna. He said, no, no, no. He said, I give my word. He said, once I give my word, I have to stand by it. So, then, so Desi Nuna went like that. He said, look, Graham, you can be here one minute and you can be gone the next. Graham slaps himself, jumps up, does a dance out the car, you peasants out the car. This is Manchester's finest. They knew not to get out the car. Yeah, they knew they would have been finished in seconds. So they said, Paul, what are you doing? So I said, Graham's my partner. I have to stand by him. Yeah, I'll stand by him. So I said, well, is it worth it, Graham, for the temple when they went? And he turned around and said, he owns half of it. So why, why didn't you not tell him? He said, why should I have to tell him? The peasants. This is the way Graham was. So anyway, on the Saturday night, I had a couple of lads there in case they come firmed up. Now, because I'm that half deaf, this is why I have a speech problem, I'm half deaf. I was just reading the paper, sat down, and as I'm reading the paper, I hear a bit of noise, look down, see a car spin off in front of the glass doors. All the glass doors have been shot through. Graham's got a girl in front of him screaming, yeah? Two of my mates that are near enough dying on the floor. Right, then I realised we've been shot. It was all over by the time I've realised. Now, what that to me, even though two of my mates, it was a buzz and a half. It was, I just had to go and enjoy a meal somewhere. It was like, wow. You're clearly protected, Paul. Like, what, pardon? You're clearly protected. Like, do you believe that? Like, you're here oh, the for power a, of the Lord, you're million here percent. For a reason, like, all the shit you've done, like, you've done many bad things. Yeah, but. This is how stupid it got. When I, uh, when I say, how can I explain it? So, 
See, when I surrounded myself, yeah, and I'm surrounding myself with firms, right, with my own little firm, that, what do you call it, that would go into anyone. There were special squads on us. I mean, like squads where the police, if I'm sat in a bar, the police would come with the cameras, get every one of my friends, stood against the wall, and say, like, say your name, where you live, this is on a camera, a police camera, and say the reason why you're with Paul Doyle tonight. And that's how it, that's how it was for so many years. I was followed by squads upon squads, units, operations upon operations. Now, if I was like in, um, say any nightclub in Manchester, and I'm sat down, even though I don't drink, I'll buy shampoos and everything, just for the lads, yeah? Even had doors open to me. Even though I don't drink, I'm sat there and there'll be, a, say somebody that making his own path in life, yeah? Once a wreck. And he's thinking, well, the biggest way to get a wreck is to do me, right? And I, by the look of him, I'm looking over thinking, oh God, this guy, is getting himself into trouble because I'll be just sat there, just waiting for him to have a couple more drinks, the Dutch courage. By the time he's come halfway, there'll be 20 Budweiser's on his head. He wouldn't have even had to get anywhere near me. And that's what I was surrounded with. Kids that was capable, where the proper police squad, because there was, was ex-Hurigans, they used to fight against the police. They used to run into, to say 20 of us, run into 300 lads where there was all professionals in violence. Mm. They wouldn't go by the Queensburys, and some of them would most probably, what do you call it, it sounds uncouth with all the stabbings now, and it, it's wrong for me to say this, but I was on a survival kit, because I'm not, I'm stuck here, yeah? So when I used to, in them days, I was like um, 17 stone, right? There's some pictures of me, all this, always shown with a big potato head. <laughs> I, yeah, horrible. So in them days, my coach used to fit me here, but the sleeves used to go to there, right? So I used to stand, go to a nightclub, whatever, and stand at the, my shoulders to the wall, right? Now, I used to always have a knife on that finger there. Yet again, you don't have guns. A knife on that finger there up in the sleeve, always wedged there, so nobody would know. So I would be having a conversation, if there was any problems, the, the finger would drop. Then, it, what do you call it? Then when the finger dropped, I would do what necessary, but I didn't have any problems. On another occasion, most probably one of the boss's firm, who's working with the boss, the ex-boss, yeah? When I've got problems with, right? Whoever works with him, such is life. Who cares, right? But I've always got eye, I'm always eyeballing. So this this guy, he said, look, he said, he said, I have to give you 10 out of 10. He said, I said, what do you mean you have to give me 10 out of 10? Now this kid's capable, he's firmed up, massive reputation, they're not shy. So I said, what do you mean you have to give me 10 out of 10? He said, you're not bowing for anyone. You don't bow. I said, well, who does bow? Will you bow? So he said, no, he said, but I'm not going against the organization. You're not just going against that boss. You're going against the organization. So I said, right, Ethram. Uh, they said, everybody, what do you call it? In my family, they normally die genetically of a heart attack before the sister. I said, I was in my forties then. I said, I haven't got, just touching for it. I said, I haven't got long left anyway. I said, what are they going to take off me 20 years? Such is life. I said, to get to nearly 40, I've swam the channel. Right, this way it's a bonus to be at the age I am now. Right, could have accepted I was going to go young. So he said, he, so he patted me down my back. Right, and I was on a couple of V's then. Right, because I don't drink, but I used to take ease, Dutch courage. And it's also, uh, in them days, if you, was, you could drive on ease. You couldn't drive on beer, but you could drive on ease. So he goes, he, there was about 20 of us, so he pat me down the back. So I thought, God, you're uh, checking if I'm like gunned up. Yeah, it. if I'm spanned up. So I've got, wow. Then uh, five minutes past, he said, Paul, before we think we've got a club, um, our own club, why don't you come to the club? Dust you, leave your lads here. Dust you, right? 
So he said, there's a wheel take you. So I said, right, no, no problem. I knew I had to do something with him patting me down the back. So I, what he called, I got on the phone to one of my brothers. So I said, look, uh, Mark, I said, I've got a flat tire, get my wheel brace down here straight away. Wheel brace, yeah. So the next thing is, he shoots down, gives it, give me my spanner, yeah. So then I'm thinking, sitting in front of his car, before we set off, I said, I'll sit in the front, his three mates are in the back, he's, he's going to drive, yeah. So I put my spanner on my knee there, and he goes, fucking hell, what are you doing? What are you doing? I said, you fucking hell. I said, you think, well, who you work for? I'm not going to be ready in this car in case anything happens. Now, I could have been paranoid, but this, he said, you'll get us all five years. So I said, well, after five years, I'll still be able to see my family. I'm not able to see them at the end of this night. If I don't bring this, I would have. So I fucking out, oh, you're paranoid, you're paranoid. So I said, oh, shut up, and went to my own friends. Mm -hmm. But that was just to prove to them that you were capable. That I was ready for him. So see, when Graham dies, you've got a hit out in your life, you're, you're surrounding your house. Like, how did you survive that? How, when did that all die down? By, it's, it's not died down. Still going on? I don't know. Cause it, cause it, I'm, I'm not going to say locking that door. Because <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to say where you said something's always protecting me. I'm not going to give the last name, but the boss's name. But he's just been arrested. It's been all over the papers and everything. The man's a peasant. To, to do what he's done is not in the rule book. Now he is such an organisation, such an organisation. I've accepted that I am going for against the organisation. I am accepted that I am going to be took out. So I've, I think to myself, I've accepted that I'm going to go down fighting. Yeah, I will take a bullet and I will, what I've dreamt about as a young kid, going out like John Wayne, everyone's a hero, right, with a bullet. But I'm going to hopefully fight so I don't get my testicles burnt off, so I don't become the head on a plate. That, that's how stupid thing is. So I have to go down fighting. Now, that's the way I've, I accepted it, yeah? But more or less what, what grew it, it was intimate that I was going. Intimate that I was going. But I now I'm thinking to myself, this firm was capable of putting money on my head to get me done here, yeah? And that's... It would have been so easy. But I think this guy has been an informer always for the last 20 odd years. He's made a deal with the police not to do anybody here. And the police have more or less said to him, look, you can do whoever you want on the continent, but don't be doing people in England. How long has this been going on for, Paul? Since um, 89. What? Yeah, exactly. Like 30 years? Over 30 yeah. years, like? 30 years. How's, uh, how have you, like, got through that life? Like, how, like, obviously you're here to tell the tale. Well, I know, I know, what do you call it? When I, I've only just come out of the system now. Yeah. Yeah, I know. When did you end up back in prison? You ended up in the jail again, did you not? I, what happened was, yeah, there was a police operation on me, right? I walked into an operation. I get seven years. Now, at the time, I don't do cocaine, right? Cocaine has just started to come out, yeah? I don't do cocaine. I was doing cannabis. And because I'm selling tons, right, I don't have to bother. In them days, when cocaine just come out around Manchester, people were selling two ounce here, two ounce there. Maybe a big dealer will sell a nine bar or a kilo that spits into nine bars for nothing. I can sell a ton of cannabis and earn a couple of hundred thousand pounds, yeah? Now, so I didn't have to do the cocaine. An undercover police officer, more or less, mugged up and everything, said to us, right, sold us a load of gold and said, right, Paul, can you get us some, um, some powder? Very clever, he said powder, it could mean whiz, could yeah, mean anything. cocaine could mean heroin, right? So I said, look, 
I don't do cocaine. I thought it meant cocaine. I don't do cocaine. If you want cannabis, I can get you cannabis. Now, because I said that, I'm saying I'm a drug dealer, so he's got every right to entrap me, yeah? So then he turns around and said, right, I'll set the cannabis off you. Takes the cannabis off me. Then he turns around and he goes like that. He said, um, he said, Paul, please, you know everyone. You can get us cocaine. You've, I'm forever getting ripped off, blah, blah, blah. He said, I said, look, tell you what I'll do. I said, there's a telephone number. This kid will serve you up. The kid gives him an ounce, just one ounce, yeah? He gets the ounce, right? Then he comes back to me, he said, how much do we owe you? I said, I don't deal with it. I do cannabis, not interest, you keep the money, right? Now, he's, little did I know, my friend phoned me up, who served him up with the ounce. Now, when I first met him, when I first met him, this undercover copper, he smelled like an undercover copper. He looked like an undercover copper. He come with my brother-in-law, right? He was, he was had a drug problem, right? And I was looking at my brother-in-law thinking, why have you brought undercover copper to me? Then this, the guy's phone went. He passed me his phone and said, oh, I'm speaking to a friend of yours. Now, pass me the phone. And Massey and um, Damien Noonan was on the other side of the phone. So now... I'm thinking, this kid can't be a copper because Massey and Noonan are not that daft, yeah? So I we had a little chat with Massey Noonan, how you doing, blah, blah, blah. Had a good chat. They put the phone down, now my guard's down. So that's when he started talking about cannabis and I give him some cannabis. And he went to think, so my mate who served him up with the ounce went like that, he said, um, Oh, you know that guy you sent me for the ounce? So he said, I said, I never sent you. I had to give him the number, he's miring for it. He said, Are you sure he's not a copper? He said, No, he can't be a copper. Massey, he was at Massey, he was on Massey's, he had Massey had him on the phone. So he said, No, he keeps bothering it, miring me for a key. Now, under half a key, the max you can get is seven years. Over half a key, it can go up. Yeah. He said, And he wants, he wants the Makes cake, senses. he wants the icing on the cake. So he said, he said, he's definitely a cop of him. So I said, I'll phone Massey up. I said, Massey, I said, you know your mate? He said, what mate? I said, the kid you was talking to me the other month on the phone for the what he call it, who, the what he, who I met that day. So he said, he said, yeah. He said, uh, how do you know him? He said, he ain't a mate of mine, he's a mate of yours. I said, what do you mean he's a mate of mine? So he said, I only met him the night before and he said, oh, you and him are best mates. And he's going to put you on the phone to me to say hello. So I said, oh, my God. Right, so I'm explaining then. Like now, every, yeah, this life bastard. No, then I was explaining, Massey and Noonan was laughing then, yeah. So then he's gone like that. He said, come down here, explain it how he wanted powder. So Massey, seeing a solicitor, because he's clever. I right, see so no one's a do it. He said, right, he got the other guy, yeah to get washing up powder, wrap it up like a key of coke, pass it in for 32 grand. It was going for 32 grand. 32 grand's worth of gold. They swap it over, yeah. Then in it, it was a solicitor note saying, don't come to Salford of Manchester selling drugs to school kids, the powder. You got powder, now leave Manchester because it was washing up powder. And you got, had, the kids that did the swap, they got charged, they had that charge thrown out. Now, I my mitigation, do you know what mitigations are? Yeah. Where you go into court and you admit what you've mm -hmm. done. My mitigations that I am guilty for passing an undercover police officer a telephone number where you can get cocaine for no financial gain and because of the consistent miver of the copper, yeah, I got seven years for that. All the rest of what was in the dot with, they all got five. And that, that, that was what it was. Well, when I got that seven, more or less what was intimate of me getting whacked out, even the week before, mm -hmm. I was getting shot at in the car by the boss's firm. The money car or another firm because I was having that much smile in them games. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, that more or less, that seven years more or less kept me alive. And you're, you're definitely alive for a reason, don't you think? Oh, that's, yeah. 
But what do you think looking back at your life, Paul? When like, it's madness, like it's like a fucking like I says, it's like a it's like a Quentin Tarantino film. It's like comedy and madness and torture no, and it's, pain. It's and... Quite, the youth of the day, right? The youth of the day are on a different pedestal. Yeah. When I got that seven years, right, and uh, I went to Strangeways, I had so many incidents as I landed in Strangeways. How so? Just uh, local thugs. You say it sounds stupid, just prison mentality. Say there's a pool table here next to the phone, there was phone cards, just a nice fast door. There was phone cards, yeah, on the phone. You had to put in them days. There's a kid on the phone. I said, who's on the phone after you? He said, nobody. I said, give me a shout when I can use the phone. I'm just finishing this game of pool off. So then I, what do you call it? The kid shouts, Doyle, you're on the phone. Now there's a queue there. There's a kid, big young kid, six foot, said there's a queue here. So I said, that's nice, stay in it. She said, what do you mean you're too old? Stay in it. I said, oh God, pad 16, mate, when you're ready. Got on the phone, you steam me a little bit, the screw's coming, he starts it out. In the morning, yeah, the kid comes in my cell and he goes, I said, oh, you shit, let's have it. I said, oh, you cheeky bastard, I'm going to kill you. Slang, what, I'm going to kill you. Yeah. So he turned around and said, he said, oh, I'll fight so I die. So anyway, we start throwing. Now, the cell's about that wide, you know, the little table and not to throw punches. So he gets down. Now, one of my moves, a trick what I've learned, you know, your two fingers there. You can push up there, right? And when you, you can squeeze the weed pipe, the weed pipe, and it's like a lot wire, it grips, it doesn't let go. So you can squeeze them to your last breath. Now he's like a muppet, a puppet, and said, do you still want to die? Now he belongs to me. Kissed him on his nose and said, thank me for not biting your nose off, blah, blah, blah. Uncouth. I've never bit anyone's nose off. Man. So anyway, so then he walks out Right, this was totally changed the life. He walks out, and I felt sorry for him, giving so many phone cards, got him some tobacco, because he took a beat, and it must have been, I was 40 then, degrading him for a young kid that stepped in the ladder to have a good idea. Then this kid called Twinner, called Hearth, went in the cell and put him unconscious, right? So any miver I have in prison, I was surrounded then, with cotton wool. The, the next thing is, when my, one of my daughters is coming to visit me, she was coming with my new grandkid, P.R., and she uh, put a bag on top of the car. Yeah, she put the bag on top of the car. Some baghead that's just come out of the prison, grabbed the bag, got off, right? So then, then the thing, we found out who the kid was visiting, right? So we found out his address. His dad's address and where the kid who did the thing there sent a firm down. The dad was supposed to be gangstified, right? But we've been diplomatic, saying, look, it's uncouth, his son's in here, we don't want him, the dad, worrying about the son. Yeah, we want the bag back, everything with it, an apology from the kid who did it, right? Because I'm not going to set liberties with young kids that have problems, yeah? So the apology come, blah, blah, blah. The governor got on it and said, look, Paul, we don't want, we're not we're aware of who you are, what you're capable of, right? We don't want any problems, blah, blah, blah. He said, you give this kid a miss. He said, then, well, but I've already made the deal with the dad. We'll let you go to any, cause now I've got seven years, so any can't be prison you want to go to, and there's a new one called Loudon Grange. So Loudon Grange, when it first opened, you say there was a wing, it had 60 on a wing, yeah? 60 on a the wing, there's an, it's like a new private prison. They would only have four manks, four scousers, four from Nottingham. But because the capital is the capital, yeah, they would allow about 30, 40. The um, Cotney's on there. Right? So the same scenario throughout my life, my reputation is somebody that should be six foot odd, yeah? Not somebody five foot eight. So everyone's heard, it's like um, the drums are out, there's a gangster coming to Loudon Grange, blah, blah, blah. 
right? A big player. So when I land, a lot of sniggering was going on, right? With uh, when they see me, right? Because I, I was super fit then, down to my fighting weight, about 13 stone. And um, so they've gone like that. Um, they've looked at me. Then they've got a Cockney's a northerner. The one went like that. He said, You're all right, cock. So I said, What do you mean am I all right, cock? He said, You're liking it here, cock. I'm thinking, what's the cock about? Yeah. Like, but it's cottonies taking the thingy, but I thought, let it go over your head. Now, when you when I said in the reform schools, you learn to turn the other cheek so you don't get mm -hmm. done in onslaught, right? I half turned the other cheek, thinking, fucking hell, cock, yeah? But I just let it go over my head, right? But there's no punches being thrown yet, yeah? So then, the last thing at night, right, he said, oh, how do you find it here, cock? So it was the first night I went in them cells thinking about cock. I was just, what is that? Like? <laughs> Walking the pad all night thinking, cock, 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 what's that about? Thinking how, could it's all cameraed up, how to get him in the pad to have it. Now, now, because if I've had that much of violence, I despise violence, despise it. Why? Just because I've seen what he's done. He's yeah. gone from having a nice fight. Now, when I, in my younger days, like, I was taught to punch with a kink, right? When my hands is like that, yeah? So when I punch, I'll throw a punch up. Then when I'm a couple, say, inches away, that's when my power comes. So that's just where I connect, then the power comes. So I, I, I'm taught to punch there, then in there, I can knock a person out. The only thing that hurts is their pride. I never fall on. I never could. I've, I've only ever been done once for violence, and that was against um, a racist guy who was in the NF, right? But I despise that I've had years of violence, even when 20 years before I wanted to walk away from it, but then I had to show to be a bit of a menace just to survive so they know I'm still capable. If I ended playing the vicar, saying um, violence is not worth it, blah, 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 they will see the weak link and come at me. Yeah, so I had to pretend that I was still a loose cannon, like I was when I was 20 or 21, still ready to prove a point, which I wasn't. So anyway, so this, when I got to Loudon Grange, I was sick to death of violence, yeah? So then, in the, the next day, this uh, this kid at dinner time said, "Yo, as I'm going for dinner, are you having any Warburton's bread with your dinner? Warburton's bread is a northern bread. Yeah, so I thought, oh God, I've had enough of this clown. I said, what is it with you, mate? I said, the thing is, are you telling me like uh, I'm your comedian? Hey. I said, get him a pad now, get him a pad. He said, we're just having a joke. I said, what do you call it? I said, I'll show you, cock, I'll fill you head in. Then this bear monster, turns round and said, I'll have it with you. That's the only thing he did was walk to my pad. He was out for about 10 minutes. I yeah, told his mates to get him, right? So then a couple of weeks after, right? A couple of, this was, this was my last fight. Now, this, I was, um, there's a thing called um, violent challenging behavior, right? A problem what they, now they understand what it is. Now, violent challenging behavior means that you could be violent in a fight, right? Not, I can have a fight and talk about the weather. It's like you've always got control of yourself, yeah? But you can be violent in the casinos, right? Where I could be winning 70 grand, but I'll still be betting because you're going, you're fighting yourself. You could do 25 press ups one day. The next day you'll do 40 press ups. It's violent, challenging behavior. Yeah. So that's one of the problems. So when I was in the gym one day and I'm on the rowing machine, every every Sunday used to get one and a half hours on the on the in the gym, right? And now the ingredients instead of just the hour. So I used to do in an hour and twenty minutes, twenty thousand meters on the rowing machine, blast it out. Yeah. So with this one occasion, this Cockney kid who's just come on the wing, right? Now, the Cockney was the first to strike people 
in prison, yeah? He come on the wing, he had a problem with a kid, made the kid put a towel on his face, sliped him, yeah? So the blood don't go everywhere. And I'm like you, the way you shake your head. I'm thinking, fucking hell, what's this about? How can anyone just put a towel there and they're set to be sliped? For wow, it's barbaric. Yeah, but it's not my problem. So on the Sunday when I'm doing 20,000 meters, he goes on the rowing machine next to me. So the day after, he come in my pad. So he goes like that. He said, why was you trying to impress me? So I said, what do you mean? He said, the way you was rowing. So I thought, wow. Now, I'm not going to say to this kid, look, mate, I'm not trying to impress you. Look, you've got the wrong bargain. I know he's most probably be ready with his daft Stanley knife, even though I've never seen a towel. So one hour of him. Yeah, one hour with him, picked his head up, opened his jaw, broke his jaw, right? That's, yeah, all bone coof. But this kid is off the rails, yeah? They even, they put him on another wing, right? Now I'm half sick, that I have to half live like this. Now that's the last fight I've had. That was the last fight. Because after that, I looked at myself in the mirror thinking you're going to end up as a stupid punchline. And even on my last sentence, even on my last sentence, all the young kids that are 10 times more capable than I was, I right, could have seen it in my own eyes, they had me around cotton wool. Well, I was talking about the earlier days where somebody wouldn't get five feet near me. That what it was like in the strange ways. That was what it was like in um, all the other prisons that went. What was it like when you heard Massa get killed? How did you feel? Heartbreaking. Sad? Sad, because uh, Massey was... We've walked into a new generation where Massey would... Um, Massey, believe it or not, got his, most of his reputation fighting against the system. Massey, Massey was in... Um, what do you call it? He's got every right to be called Manchester Mr. Big. Because even, they say, I'm capable of whatever, right? He's got a hundred like me, but I will stand in front of Massey. I will stand as a friend to do whatever for Massey. If Massey had a, a firm, or oh, the people think I knew about that, I would go and see Massey and say, let's do them before they do you for Massey, because that's how much of a friend Massey was. What about the Nunes? How tough were they back in the day? They was gangstified. They was gangstified. Desi, on that documentary, what Desi Noonan uh, mentioned, and more half the people, right, when he turned around and said, he's, more got, he's got more guns than the police. Everyone laughed and they thought it was humorous and everything like that, right? But he did have so many lads with guns. He's did, he was capable of getting lads to do whatever. Now, Damon was a different clique. Damon uh, run the doors in Manchester. Any gangsters used to go in that hacienda. Damon had a, did what they called a gangster hat. Oh, you must, the way you're mouthing off, oh, you must be a gangster. There's your hat, do you want me to get your cigar? They, they, they was all capable, but that was part of Massey's firm. Paul Massey, yeah, I know a lad who um, had seven kids, just like my father had, had seven kids. I walked into this um, lad's house. On his wall, there's not one picture of his kids. There's just pictures of Massey on his wall. And that's what, that's what Massey was about. Let's talk about your book, Paul. You've got your book out now. Um, where can people buy that? Pardon? Where can people buy your book? Amazon? Yeah, but now it's coming, in, now it's coming, it's going to be into the shops. Good. And that. Uh, I'll yeah. leave the link in the description and that. Just before we finish up, your, one of your toughest fights, he says it was against one of the Nunans, is that correct? Why, why it was such a toughest fight? Right, because I've, um, I've never been beat. Yeah, I've never been beat. But this fight with Damien Noonan, I, when I come out of Lindholm, and I was like the fittest I've ever been, I was 11 and a half stone, I could put 50p in every stomach muscle, 
and the 50Ps will stick out. Super, super fit, right? Now, I would drink my last blood before I was beat. I'd be have to put me in a coma, right? Now, I had a, Damien was only 21 years of age. He wasn't the 20 son of what people seen on the Hacienda. He was a young kid stepping through life, ready to step through it. Now, I had a little bit of an argument over a parking space. He stole it on me, split my nose down the middle. He was the first man I had to fight what I couldn't see for a couple of minutes. Now, I come back from such a panning for the first couple of minutes, right? And I managed to win that fight. Couldn't knock him out. Managed to win it because he ran out of breath and raised his hands. Mm -hmm. So I come back from the death. If he would have been fitter, I most probably would have been comatized. For anybody that's watching, Paul, that's maybe wanting to get involved in a life of crime, like we used to all watch the films and we used to glamorize it and we used to think, oh, that is a great life. But what advice would you give for anyone who wants to get involved and try and be a bad boy? Well, that's a good question. And what I would turn around and say is don't surrender. Where these young kids now, they're getting involved in gangs. And when they're involved in gangs, half, 90% of them could have seen it on the last census and they're walking around like zombies. 90% of them have surrendered like I surrendered, thinking I'm going to have a life of crime. I'm going to get a life sentence. So I might as well get it young. They're taking knives out to what they call it, to willing to go all the way. So really, they've surrendered themselves. There's no need to surrender. If you're a criminal now, you can't drive the nice cars. The police will take it off you. If you're a nine to five worker, you can lease it. They should have areas for young criminals to go who, who are ready to surrender, to cool down. They should send them to the other side of the country and say, there is a get out. Because I have, what do you call it? Now, I've come out after 10 years. I've spent nearly 10 years in prison. I have to get my teeth done because you can't, so you can't go to a dentist there inside the system. I've got to come out and see about getting my teeth done for 20 grand. It's what you, it's, these kids are walking zombies. Now, when I see these kids and I see myself in them and what the, what life they're going through, it's heartbreaking. Yeah, it's and there is a get out cause for them, is not to surrender. See, when you were talking through your inter interview there, you were talking about you always challenge yourself on accepting to surrender. Like, how do you think your life would have been if you'd made a decision not to surrender and go fuck this and try and make changes? One of my brothers, Michael, yeah, he's my older brother, mm -hmm. yeah? He's got... Now, people have took him for me because he's six foot, yeah? He's six foot one. People in the early days, they took him for me. He's even got a slash mark down there, right? Big good looking lad, he's got a slash mark there. Never, he wouldn't even go to the police, yeah? Now, He's not a criminal, far from a criminal, but he's got his fighting genetics. Like even hundreds of gold diggers out there, they've got fighting genetics, get drunk, they'll have fight. Some of them will go home winning, some will go home losing, but it's all in a night, right? But they're not criminals. My brother, I'll say to my brother in the earlier days, Mike, I've got a ride. I can throw you on a ride where you can earn 60, 70 grand. Michael turned around and he said, look, Paul, I'm a nine to five worker. I what do you call it? I have three holidays a year. I'm happy with it. Stick with your life. Mm -hmm. And that is more or less with the way I was brought up, where the, the, the what you've way we just turn around and why I said don't surrender, but what also but you don't surrender, but you've got to use your thinking skills. And you've got to think how you're not gonna get involved in this. Is it worthwhile? Yeah. Paul. It's for been a pleasure. i telling your story, man. Listen, it's been a mad roller coaster. I oh, wish it's you something out of the movie. Yeah, I wish you all the best for the future. Stay out of trouble. And God bless you, Paul. Well, do you know a good dentist? Thank you. <laughs>